I guess the first thing I'd like to just ask you is how you're doing. I'm doing great. So what's great? You? What's great about what what you're doing? What's so good about your life? Well, right now I'm in the process of putting together my next stand-up comedy special. So uh, I'm at the process now where I've actually put together a full new hour of material since my Netflix special, which came out in October. So uh, that's that's great for me. It's uh, that's always a, a relaxing moment because it's very difficult to put that hour together. And so it's and so how do you go about doing that? A lot of writing, a lot of performing, a lot of reading, a lot of uh, going over notes, a lot of examining material, a lot of reviewing sets and trying to find out what I like and what I don't like. It's, it's a long and brutal process. It's the, mo it's the most fun, but also the most difficult part of stand-up is the creation of new material. So how many hours do you think you put in of work to do an hour's worth of stand-up? Any idea? That's a really good question. It's usually about, I can do, a, I can create a solid 10 minutes a month. That's usually what it is. So it takes me six months to do an hour. And in that six months, on an average week, I'll do eight or nine sets. So that's uh, eight or nine, either half hour or hours of material, sometimes 15 minutes, usually an hour, depending upon where I'm working and how many other people are on the show. Um, and then a lot of time writing. So, so you're doing those sets in front of live audiences all the time? Yes. Yeah, you have to. That's, that's the weird thing about stand-up comedy. It seems to be that it's, it, it's not something that you can do in a vacuum. It has right. to actually be done. It, actually, it has to come alive in front of the audience. Like I can, I can write in a vacuum. I can write alone. I can uh, contemplate, go over my material review, uh, edit. I can do all sorts of things by myself, but it really doesn't come alive until it's in front of an audience. Yeah, well, I guess it's not so easy to figure out what's funny. You kind of hope yeah. that people will laugh. Yeah, it's that, but it's also there's a state of mind that you only really achieve when you're performing in front of an audience. And you can try to recreate it, but it'll be fake. If you try to do it on your own, like I don't write, I don't write in joke form. Like I don't write the way I say it on stage. I write in sort of a conceptual form. I write in an essay form. And then I sort of extract things that I think are funny out of that. But it, they really only find their true, the true way I'm going to do them. I only find that in front of an audience. Because it, it's like when, the, when I'm in front of an audience, then it, it becomes clear to me how I should and shouldn't say things based in part on how they're reacting and based in part on how I feel when I'm performing the idea. Like I find where the, the fat of the bit is. And that's where you kind of appreciate economy of words and you know what to edit out and what to elaborate on, what people aren't totally understanding and what maybe is over-explained and all that stuff kind of comes together in front of an audience. So the essays that you're writing or the writing that you're doing, like, are they on serious topics? Are they on things you're thinking about philosophically or are you trying specifically to be funny or are you just trying to get some thoughts down? you know, about the way you're thinking about the world? Both. You know, it's like the ideas, if it's, I always say the stand-up comedy, at least the way I do it, it comes in three forms. Like there's three steps. In the beginning, you're really just trying to get laughs. You're fighting for survival out there. You're scared. That's in the early days of your career. Then you start doing what you think is funny, like things that would make you laugh. But then in stage three, you start trying to make ideas funny and you try to cleverly introduce ideas into people's heads that maybe they wouldn't entertain without the humor aspect of it. And so when I write, if I write on a subject, whatever the subject might be, I write without thinking, oh, I have to make each word funny or I have to make each sentence funny. I write just what are my thoughts on this subject. And then along the way, I find irony and I find ridiculous perceptions and all the things that lead to stand-up comedy material. Right. And, and I how, track those. Right. And how much of the like humor and the wit just occurs to you spontaneously on the stage? 
Sometimes a lot. It depends on the subject, but it, it's always a possibility. Some of the best lines that I've ever come up with in my act come up with uh, I come up with on the spot while I'm just talking about things. Right. Well, that should be when you're like into the subject and and things are going well with the audience. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically how it goes. It's a tricky business. Yeah. It sounds like an extremely tricky business and one where the cost of failure is, is humiliation and, and, and uh, emotional pain. Yeah. It's the worst. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's not, there's not that many things that are more embarrassing than like trying to be funny, especially if you've put, say a hundred hours into one hour of preparation, which is less than you're doing. And then finding out that you're just not that amusing. <laughs> that doesn't More sound common than not. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. It's not good. So, so how many Netflix specials have you done now? Uh, I've done three and uh, I'm working on my fourth one right now, but overall I've done nine different hours of comedy, either a comedy album or a video special. Yeah. Uh, what, and you, what's it been like working for Netflix? It's great. They're it's very great. easy. Oh, that's yeah, good. They, they don't, they really don't have any notes. They just let me, it, you know, fortunately I got to them at a stage in my career where I was already advanced and I was already a headliner and I'd already been doing stand up comedy for decades. So it was, it was good in that sense that I, I was well prepared, but they, you know, they, when we first, signed this initial deal they were they were really just wanting me to do what i do best right so they liked it and it's easy there's no there's really relatively little input almost none right so they're that. they're they're not willing to mess with success fundamentally yeah they like what i do so they're just like go ahead just right. and they know that my goal is to do my best i'm not trying to i mean there are comedians that will release material just for the money they'll try to capitalize on their fame and put something out that's sloppy and i feel like for me at least that's that's not an option and that would taint my legacy and taint my uh, my body of work i'm not interested in doing that right right yeah well i've seen your netflix specials and they're pretty damn funny thank you that that that's that 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 that, uh little skit you did on the kardashians (laughs) that was a killer man Thank you. That took forever to work out. I, I had to figure out a way to make fun of that guy. God, <laughs> Poor girl. God, God it, was, yeah, it, was, it was ridiculous. You make an extremely intense demonic gargoyle. A very good <laughs> sense of humor. Yeah, so that was killing me. I thought, Jesus, he's not going to go there, is he? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's gonna oh, he's going to go farther. Yeah. It's good. It good to see that kind of like horrific courage manifest itself on stage. You really like that in a comedian, you know, when you see them get going. And I used to see this with Sarah Silverman. You could see her eyes sort of flash and she'd think, oh, I shouldn't say that. Now, there's no way anyone should say that. <laughs> then she'd say it. You'd think, yep. oh, no one should have said that. But man, it was deadly. Yeah, I think out of all the women doing comedy right now, she's probably the best at that. You know, she can come up with some, pushing that envelope. Yeah, that's for, that's for sure. She's got, there's some very dark recesses in that woman's mind. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the Netflix thing is going well. Do you do you enjoy do you enjoy doing that? Yes. Uh, yeah, what, I what enjoy is it. it. What, do, what, do, what do you like about it? The danger of it, the the difficulty, the challenge that one it's done and people enjoy it. That I'm legitimately affecting people. I love I love that. Well, people they'll get a chance to sit down and watch it for an hour, and it'll make them feel better. They'll laugh. They, 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 it takes them out of the dreary dullness of their day or the agony of whatever they're going through in their life. And they can escape that for an hour. And yeah. Thank they, God for comedy, man. It's just about, it's just in the same domain as music for necessity. Yeah, I agree. It, you know, it there, are, there, there are campuses now where there's like no sarcasm rules, say. Eh? Oh, that's hilarious. God, can you oh, imagine? I'd, I'd last God, about I 15 seconds. <laughs> like, yeah, is, is sarcasm considered a microaggression? Is that yes, it definitely. Is? Yeah, <laughs> unless it's real sarcasm, in which case it's a macroaggression. I just keep thinking that in time, this is going to be one of the most hysterical uh, periods of time that people look back on. Periods of history, like you know, when we look at guys with powdered wigs and you know preposterous behavior from the past, and we go, God, what were they thinking? 
I really think we're going to do the same thing about today. I think well, well, I hope one so. of the most, I, I think for sure. I, think I hope so. Sure. That means that we'll be more sane when we're looking back, or at least we'll be I, sane in a different way. And I'm pretty much ready for a different form of insane per- personally. Well, I think the insane that you're getting is so, it, it's so pronounced and it's so much more intense that it ha- it's less effective. And then the reaction to it is more popular. The, the negative reaction to the, a lot of this insane rhetoric and this insane behavior. It's more popular now to understand how ridiculous some of these people are. You know, when you see like what Antifa's doing in Portland, blocking traffic and, you know, the, the, telling people where to go and what to do and then beating people up that don't comply and saying that you're a white supremacist if you don't listen to them. And like this, this, all this stuff is so ridiculous. It's so over the top. And they keep feeding on themselves. They keep attacking people that are not progressive enough. They keep literally eating their own. And it, it, for the, from the outside, from the perspective of people that don't share their ideology, it looks more and more ridiculous. And that makes them more and more frenzied. And it ramps it all up. And I think it's ultimately going to crash. It's just like, what kind of damage is it going to do to the landscape as it's crashing? Right, right. Well, that's, that's the thing that, you know, hopefully can be mitigated so that the landing isn't too hard. Yeah. So I thought, look, every time we've talked, we've talked a lot about me. And like, I'm quite sick of talking about me, actually, and probably have been for like a year or maybe even longer. So I thought that it would be really good to talk about you. And I'm curious about you because you're such a strange character. And so... Um, you know, in the in the most interesting of ways. And so I thought I'd like start at the beginning. So I don't know that much about you. So um, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in a lot of places. I was born in New Jersey. Um, I lived there until I was seven. My mother uh, split up from my dad and married my stepdad. We moved to California. We lived in San Francisco from age seven to 11. Then I lived in Florida. He was going to the University of Florida at Gainesville. Lived there from age 11 to right around 13. Then we moved to Boston, and I lived in Boston for the next, I guess, the next 10 years. And that's really where I grew up. I grew up basically, when I, when I think of where I come from, I think of Boston. It's also the place where I started doing stand-up comedy, which means a lot to me. And it's also where I started fighting where I started doing martial arts. All the significant things that happened in my life happened in Boston in my developmental period. And and so you moved to Boston when you were how old? 13. 13, I see. Yeah. Right, right. And then you were there for how many years? 11, 11 years. Oh, yeah, so that's a long time. Yeah. Where do you live in Boston? Newton, Newton, Upper Falls. It's a suburb of Boston. Yeah, yeah. Nice in New England, eh? Yeah, I love it out there. Yeah, you me know, too. The people have a great sense of humor. It's uh, like Toronto in a way that you have to deal with that wicked winter. And I think that develops character in people. I think it was funny. You, you know, when I moved to Boston, because I, well, I'd lived in Alberta and then Montreal. And Montreal is bloody horrible in the winter and Alberta is even worse. And so I was, I'd go down to Boston and I went down there to interview first and it was February and like, it was spring as far as I was concerned. I didn't even have a coat on. And then when we lived there for years, you know, it was so funny. We lived in this old house by a park and we'd get those nor'easters blow in, you know, with the hurricane level winds and it bloody well snowed three and a half feet. And I'd be thinking in my Canadian way that, Jesus, I better not go outside because I'll just freeze to death the second I step outside. But I'd go outside and it was like, well, it was 34 degrees or some damn thing. It's like I was expecting minus 40, you know, just horrible. So my Boston winters never, I mean, apart from the snow, which was, you know, deadly significant, they never really struck me as winter. They sort of struck me as, well, this is the sort of winter that you'd like to have if you wanted a, like a showy winter that people could be pleased with <laughs> rather than one that just sort of killed you. Yeah. Yeah. Canadians are on another level when it comes to winter. I have some pretty good friends that live in Alberta. And uh, when I, whenever I go up there, it's like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where, do you, where, do you where do you go? Where do you go? They're uh, outside of Edmonton. They're oh, about yeah. uh, two and a half hours north of Edmonton. Where? 
Uh, I don't know the name of their town. It's where I go bear hunting. Uh-huh. Um, that's uh, yeah, because bear. Very... You know, you might one thing you notice about bear is they have fur. See, that's yeah. why they can live there. Human, <laughs> they don't have fur. So they actually yeah. can't live there. Yeah, two and a half hours north of Edmonton in the winter. Yeah, yeah. You, you go it's outside. And, yeah, you go outside in the wrong day, and you're out there too long, then you die. So yeah, or you run into a grizzly, which is well, also. That, that yes there's also that those 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 are those are nothing to contend those are nothing to take lightly man when we used to go camping especially in british columbia grizzly bears were always a concern because like a black bear if it chases you and first of all it's only about third the size of a grizzly bear and it's still pretty big like it's a black bear you know it's not it's not like a house cat and if those things chase you and you and you play dead they'll usually leave you alone but if you grizzly chases you and you play dead then it eats you and so and then of course if you fight back well it also eats you it just maybe you get a, a blow or two in and probably not so yeah that was well, one of the believe terrors it or not, of more, more people are uh preyed upon by black bears when a, a black bear attacks you it's usually because it's trying to eat you when a grizzly bear attacks people it's usually either mistake or it was sh- it was scared or it's really hungry yeah, the black bears tend to be like that too. A lot of them are old if they attack you. Yeah, you know? yeah. They're, they're getting, yeah. they're getting so they can't catch a real animal, so they're they'll settle exactly. for like a, uh, you know, a, an arctic monkey with no fat. So <laughs> yeah, they get desperate. Yeah. So okay. So New Jersey. What do you remember about New Jersey? Uh boy, that's where I went to Catholic school, which was a, a, a horror in and of itself. And uh, it's, you know, where my relatives lived. And I just remember the, the ethnic, ethnic Italian environment and what that was like, you know, what, what it was like being around my relatives around there. Very Sopranos-like, if you ever watch the TV show. Oh, yeah. That's, that's really representative of a lot of New Jersey. You know, hmm. I don't remember too much other than that, though. You know, I was pretty you little did, when we you left. Do still have relatives out there? Um, I have one uncle. Well, two uncles that still live there. That's you ever it. see them? I haven't seen them in years. Okay, so New Jersey, mostly positive memories, do you think? Or just, it's just, I mean, seven and below, that's pretty young, so. Well, it was a tumultuous time period for me. My parents were uh, always fighting, and it just it wasn't a good time. So when we escaped New Jersey, it was a relief. And, and that was, was also relief. when your mom split up from your dad? Yeah. And do you, yeah. do you, do you, do you, are you in contact with your dad? No, I haven't spoken to him since I was seven years old. Is he still alive? He's still alive. And his name's Joe Rogan, which is even crazier. Huh. So you ever think about him? No, no, not no, really. No, no, it's a long time ago. Well, that's, huh. Well, and do you remember what he was like to you? He was nice to me. He just wasn't very nice to my mother. Just, they had a very bad relationship. Right. Right. Okay, so you leave New Jersey and you go to California. Yeah. Where do you live there? We lived in San Francisco. And uh, that was an interesting time for me because it was during the Vietnam War. And it was sort of the height of the hippie movement. Right. And my stepdad was a hippie. <clears throat> my father was a police officer in New Jersey. Oh, yeah. So I went from being around a cop who was a pretty brutal guy to being around a long haired hippie who was all about peace and love. And was an architecture student, you know, it was a completely different sort of vibe. Yeah. sounds like a completely different sort of vibe. Yeah. Um, I was, was around a lot of gay folks. Yeah. I was around a lot of hippies, a lot of pot smokers, a lot of real open-minded thinkers and weirdos around Haight-Ashbury and, and that, that sort of area. We lived near Lombard Street. It was real classic San Francisco in the 70s. 70s. So, yeah. So, yeah. let's see. So, you would have been, you said, seven. How? So, when I were you? I guess it was like 74. 74. Probably 74 because I was uh, seven years old. Right. I was born so, in 67. You're, yeah. So, you're five years. I see. You're five years younger yeah. than me. So, that... Yeah. So that places you there. So yeah, it was still pretty hippie central. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. Um, and then I went from there to Florida, which was like a total polar opposite. You know, that was uh, the first time I'd ever heard anybody say the N word was in Florida and I didn't know what it meant. 
I had to ask my mother. My mother got upset at me. She thought I knew what it meant. I was just playing games. I was like, I don't know what it means. I'm like, tell me what it means. And she said, it's a bad word for black people. And I was like, wow, really? Like, okay. Because I was hearing it all the time. I, I, I never heard it in San Francisco. I literally didn't hear it until I was 13 years old. Or, uh, excuse me, 11 years old. And so, yeah, so where did you move to in Florida? We moved to Gainesville, which is where the University of Florida was, uh, where my stepdad was going um, to get a, he was, uh, go, he's studying architecture. And then we eventually moved to Boston so he could go to the Boston Architectural Center. That's why we wound up moving there. And is your mom, and is your mom and your stepdad still together? Yep, still together. And do you yeah, see they, them? All the time. Yeah, they have a great relationship. It's really oh. completely different. They've been together forever. They, they just, they get along fantastic. And in many ways, that sort of modeled my uh, expectations for a real relationship. You know, like I saw the worst and then I saw a really great one. And I'm like, okay, I want that, you know. Yeah, that's a good choice. That's, that, that shows some wisdom on your part, picking the second yeah. one rather than the first one, let's say. <laughs> yeah. 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 And has that worked out? Have you had good relationships? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, my wife's awesome. I yeah, you've been married fantastic. for how long? Almost 10 years. 10 years. And you have two girls or three? I have three girls. Three um, girls, right, yeah. Two young ones and one adult one. Right, I remember on the special that I was referring to that you were bemoaning the fact that you were absolutely <laughs> saturated in a feminine environment. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, man. It's interesting, but I think it balances me out. I think ultimately it's probably good for me. Yeah, you think good. it's interesting now. You wait till they hit teenagehood. <laughs> yeah, then it'll be interesting, all right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I actually enjoyed having teenagers, you know, weirdly enough. I mean, we had a good rule in our house. with Our kids brought their friends over to our house a lot. Um, and it was funny because when they first came over, when my teenagers' friends came over, they were always afraid of me. But after about a month of being there, you know, like getting to know the place a bit, not staying there all the time, obviously, but getting a bit familiar with it, they ended up being a lot more afraid of my wife. So that was quite funny. But she's, you know, she, she just looked like, she doesn't look that dangerous on first impressions. And she's kind of soft-spoken, but uh, she's very unforgiving. That might be one way of putting it. And yeah, we had a, we had a pretty good rule in our house with, with the teenage kids, which is was... It's a good one to know, which was, look, we're really happy you're here, you know, but if you do something really stupid and we never, ever have to see you again, that would actually be okay with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good rule. It's a good That's rule. A good well, rule. They also knew yeah. we meant it. And so the kids could have their friends over, you know, and they could have a reasonable, they could have a reasonable amount of fun or maybe even a slightly unreasonable amount of fun, but they couldn't have an overwhelmingly unreasonable amount of fun. <laughs> so, that's a great way to put it overwhelmingly unreasonable amount of fun is a great way to put it yeah that was too much too much we had a good drug policy too i think which was how'd that go i think it went well the rule was um look i know perfectly well you're going to experiment they were going to art, an art school you know it's like oh i think sure. so i think the, one of the majors mm. was like pot smoking and Another was <laughs> experimentation. Like th there was just no way they weren't going to experiment. And my rule was, um, I better not be able to tell because you're being too much of a fool. So if you're going <laughs> to experiment, you better handle it because otherwise you're pathetic. And that, that seemed to be pretty good. Well, that's, you know, because I thought, the, I really thought it through, you know, because there's a, there's a literature on uh, experimentation among adolescence, both criminal experimentation, you know, delinquency, minor delinquency and that sort of thing, and drug use, and you get pathology at both ends. The ones who are, you know, smoking pot every day and taking drugs on a regular basis, their outcome's not so good. But the ones who abstain completely and never experiment, their outcome is also not so good. They tend to be on the dependent, anxious end of the distribution. And so, you know, you want your kids to, well, play with the rules a little bit. But then I thought, well, what, so, okay, you got to play with the rules a little bit. What are the rules about playing with the rules? And one should be, try not to be a bigger fool than necessary. That's a good one. So you're not compromising yourself in the present. But the biggest, the biggest issue, I think, really, and I think this is the fundamental rule for experimentation with 
with adolescence is you don't get to screw up your future. Mm. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the killer. Well, what I worry about more than anything is opioids. Um, I, I worry about those uh, because people are dying from them. Yeah. You know, no one's dying from pot. It's very rare that anybody is doing something so stupid that they put their life in danger from pot or mushrooms. I'm worried about the ones that kill you. You know, I mean, I, I worry about pills more than anything that my children might possibly face, especially when I consider the fact that these opiate manufacturers, these opioid manufacturers, they keep making these damn things stronger. And I don't understand. I mean, it's not like Oxycontin wasn't strong enough as it is, but now they have fentanyl. And now they're coming up with things that are stronger than fentanyl. It's disgusting. Yeah, you know, well, what, it's a what, weird arms race, eh? Because, I mean, this yeah. is something that's really an unexpected consequence of the, of the illegalization of drugs is that now we've generated all these chemists who are really good at making tiny variations on every psychoactive substance known. And now instead of like 10 addictive substances you can get yourself into serious trouble with, there's 300. Yeah. So that doesn't seem to be a big plus. No, it doesn't. It's It's... It's disturbing and it's disgusting. And, you know, they're finally starting to bring some of these guys to justice and they're arresting some of these people and bringing them to court. Uh, some of these manufacturers, but they've been pushing this stuff down people's throats for years and incentivizing yeah. doctors to subscribe them. And it's, yeah, well, it's, it's a tough one, man. Like my, when my daughter was sick, um, when she was a kid, she was in extreme it's got to be agony is the right word, you know, for like two years about that because she was walking around on two broken legs. You know her story a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the physician at Sick Kids, which was, which was the person who was dealing with her arthritis, would only prescribe her basically, uh, you know, anison, you know, minor league over-the-counter painkillers, which was like trying to kill a grizzly bear with a fly swatter. It really it wasn't right, the right tool for the job. And we found a family doctor who had enough courage to prescribe her Oxycontin. And that was no joke, you know, because for the first couple of weeks she was on Oxycontin. It was really odd and rough because it was like she was drunk. And so that was, mm. well, that was weird socially, to say the least, and also rather frightening, but it did control her pain. And we actually had them mix Oxycontin with uh, Ritalin, which is a strange combination, but a good one to know about because Oxycontin sedates and Ritalin stimulates, but the combination of the two are synergistic so they can really control pain. And so her pain was controlled enough so that it didn't drive her insane over about a two-year period. And then once she got her operations and had her, had her legs fixed, she went off the opiates and she went through the whole withdrawal stick. You know, she had like night sweats and she had ants crawling under her skin. And like, it was pretty brutal. Although she, she stopped cold Turkey and never tried them again. She hated them. She said they just made her feel dead. And it's funny, a mm. lot of people, you know, a lot, you hear the horror stories that, you know, if you try opiates once, you're pretty much screwed because they're so wonderful, but lots of people don't like them, but there is a sizable minority of people, you know, who really like them. And, and then there is the danger that you described of overdose. And that's, you know, that's, that's a frightening thing. Hopefully your kids I, are smart enough to stay mostly away from pills. Yeah, hopefully. What are, you know, you got to worry about the influence of their friends and peer pressure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, the terrible thing about teenagers, you know, is that everybody always says, well, why do you succumb to peer pressure when you're a teenager? And the answer is, well, that's why you're a teenager. You know, you're getting away from your family mm -hmm. and you're even getting away from your like elementary school best friend and you're starting to join the broader social group and your job is to fit in, like not to fit in so much that there's nothing left of you, you know, but your job is to fit in to the tribe, to the group and to learn how yeah. to do that. And of course, the downside is, well, <laughs> you're susceptible to peer pressure, but there's, it's hard to distinguish that from actually being properly socialized you know the two things are very tightly aligned mm. all right so so you were in florida and you learned you learned some words that that you didn't know and what was florida like for you you were there only for a couple of years <clears throat> yeah florida is a strange place i mean i, th I still have a love-hate relationship with florida 
It's uh, the land of the lost. It's where people go to escape wherever they're from. Um, Billy Corgan, uh, who's uh, uh, Billy Corbin, who's a uh, uh, documentary director. He directed Cocaine Cowboys and uh, a bunch of other great documentaries. He uh, he lives down in Florida, and every time he and I talk, we just talk about how ridiculous Florida is, and it's this place where people go to escape. They go to escape from the brutal cold of the Northeast winter, or they go, oh, Jesus, my yeah, phone back. is, yeah, my phone is telling me that I'm running out of batteries. <clears throat> I'm going to have to switch headsets and plug this in, but okay. it only took a second. Yeah. That should be fine. But okay. uh, I just think that Florida is just like a uniquely stupid place. <laughs> well, it's a weird place. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, one of the things that's really struck me about the United States that's really different than Canada, for what that's worth, it's not like Americans really care why the United States is different than Canada, apart from the fact that it isn't like freezing cold six months of the year. There's a, there's a lot of, the U.S., it's like a movie set. You know, so much of it is like, it's manufactured to look like something else. And mm-hmm. Florida is really like that. Yeah. You know? And it, it, it's, it's a very strange place to visit. Because everything is not in the old towns, but the beach towns are like that a lot. That there's some, there's some genuine old Florida, but most of it is it's manufactured fake utopia for exactly the sort of people that you're describing. You know that doesn't yeah. make it unbearable or anything. I mean, the weather's nice and the beach is nice, and you know there's worse places to live. But there's something about it that's like a I don't it's it's like a ah. Uh, it's, a re- it's got this, well, obviously it's like a resort, but resorts have that sort of fake utopian element to them that is, I don't know what it's like exactly. It's kind of like a child fantasy or an adolescent fantasy, something like that. You know, it's what you think yeah. you want. If you don't yeah, think you're hard. I always say that if you want to starve to death, open up a bookstore in Miami. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like legitimately. There's there's no reading going on down there. It's just a strange place where people go to party and it's, it's just it's weird. Right. Now I have to warn you that there is a beam of light shooting directly out of your head. Oh, right here? Yeah, it's yeah. it's very impressive. Right. And and I'll move be, this around. There we go. Yeah, there that's probably go. better because you know I had to plug in. Because uh, the power was dying on my phone. I guess this video stuff sucks a lot of power out of your I guess, phone. I guess so. I guess so. I mean, I didn't yeah, like the whole, I didn't the the whole the light thing shooting out of your head, but you never know. You don't want to get any rumors started <laughs> on the internet. You know how easy that is. Well, yeah, you amongst all people know how easy that is. Hey, you, I, haven't been, hey I haven't been in a scandal for a whole, a whole week. Well, this podcast is still young. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. We might be able to cover something that'll cause trouble. Any luck. Yeah, you are, <clears throat> out of all the people that I'm friends with, you are probably the most misrepresented friend that I have. And uh, I defend you quite often, and I, I, I don't get where people are coming from with you. I don't understand their inability to listen to your words. And instead, they try to generalize and formulate these distorted distorted the descriptions of who you are and what you stand for. And it's very strange to me. And I don't know. I mean, I kind of do know that you're challenging a lot of people's beliefs and the, the way they, you know, they've, they've structured these beliefs, but it's very frustrating to me. And I'm sure it must be way more frustrating for you. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's surreal to me because I was talking with my kids about this the other day, you know, the, the way people think I am, especially if they read, you know, the hit pieces that the journalists have written and maybe even watch me in those interactions, you know, they think I'm provocative and they think I like combat and conflict. And, you know, um, and I don't, I'm not combative actually. And I really don't like conflict that much. Um, I go out of my way quite a bit to avoid it. And, you know, I'm misogynist, except that almost all the people I've ever worked with in my whole life have been women, and I've been in a women-dominated field. And, like, and I never thought of myself as right-wing, that's for sure. I mean, 
I mean, maybe now that the far left has gone completely off the deep end, it's like, well, maybe I'd be classified as a conservative. But that's mostly because as a social scientist, I learned that you shouldn't conduct large scale experiments on huge swaths of the population and assume that your stupid idea is going to work out correctly because it won't. You can't even get people to behave properly in a lab for like half an hour. So how you think you're going to get a whole society to do what you want, you know, as a consequence of passing a piece of legislation is beyond me. But yeah, it's, it's, and here's something else that's weird. You know, like if you read the newspapers on this, this new, you knew I got disinvited from Cambridge, Cambridge Divinity School. I mean, what, what a thing to be disinvited from a divinity school. Christ, you have to be Satan himself to get disinvited from a divinity school. And, you know, <laughs> well, it's so, it's so crazy. You know, and I just wanted to go down there and learn some more about the biblical stories, the Exodus stories. That was the idea. And, and then to get disinvited to have that would be a whole big scandal. It was just like, what the hell, man? It's, it's, it's quite the crazy situation. And then, so you read about all this and, and you see this online and you would think, God, his life must just be hell because of all the controversy. But then when I go out in the streets or to my lectures or anywhere, it's completely different. It's unbelievably different. Like, so now if I walk, walk down the street, I mean, when you walk down the street, you must just get, you just must get uh, identified all the time. Eh? Like, yeah. if you go out in an hour, how many people will come up to you? Depends where I go, <clears throat> but uh, if I'm in Hollywood, it's pretty pretty crazy. If yeah. I go around young people, if you see men and they have shaved heads and tattoos, it gets nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my people, How muscular men. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so if I go out, you know, and I'm walking down the street, and it doesn't really matter where, usually I get approached five or six times in an hour by people, and, you mm. know, they're always very polite. And they're very apologetic, and they they are ha happy about something they've read or listened to or whatever. Or often they talk about our podcast. That's pretty damn common. That was common throughout Europe, as well. And you know they tell me about some dark part of their life and how they're doing much better, and you know how their friends have been watching my videos and they're feeling better about it. And so it's just ridiculously positive, just all the time. And then when I go to my lectures. It's the same thing. It's like yeah. crazily positive. So, you know, we've had 350,000 people at the lectures so far, and there hasn't been one negative occurrence. We had one heckler once who was rapidly escorted from the building, and he knew he was going to get escorted, so he was kind of a cooperative heckler. But, like, no one's coming there with any thing negative on their mind. They're there to listen to a psychological lecture and to have a deep discussion and to try to get their act together. And the goddamn journalists, they just don't seem to be able to fathom that. Like they've got this false cynicism or maybe real cynicism that makes it absolutely impossible for them to believe that, you know, tens of thousands of people could actually be serious about improving their life and that I could be having events that were basically 100% positive. And so online, I'm a bloody monster. You know, I'm a misogynist and a racist and a transphobe and a, what else am I? I'm a homophobe and a, oh, a Nazi lots of times and sometimes a Jewish shill. And, um, well, there's a bunch of other things too. Well, oh, what yeah. disturbed me, <clears throat> excuse me, what disturbed me about you is when they pulled your books out of New Zealand. When a New Zealand bookstore decided to pull your books because of the, the Christchurch massacre. Like, what does a book on self-improvement and taking responsibility, what does that have to do with a horrific mass murder? I mean, the, yeah. the idea that they con connected those two together and that they decided that in some way or shape, your words of encouragement and recognizing the importance of discipline and of taking responsibility and self-reliance, that those things, your, your book, somehow or another had something to do with someone doing something as awful as what happened at Christchurch. It's, it's so distorted. And that's like the perfect example that I cite when I say, like, th think about the fact that this guy's book was removed right after something had taken place that had literally nothing to do with anything you've ever said ever. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> they kind of got their comeuppance in some ways because people started to point out that they were still carrying Mein Kampf. And so that turned out oh, to be God. a problem. And then they were also carrying a book that showed you how to turn a semi-automatic into a fully automatic. And so, you know, you got to be careful when you go after someone for their sins that you don't have a few sins of your own, like, lying around where people can, you know, sort of observe them. Anyways, yes. they did reverse that decision, but... But uh, oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that was good. But <coughs> it is. It's very weird. It's 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 a. And I'm going to the UK here right away. Now we're talking about me, and we weren't supposed to be. But I'm going to the UK right away because the paperback is launching there, and so I'm going to be talking to journalists and talking to UK journalists. Man, that's like jumping into a, a tub of well, not full-grown crocodiles, but you know, like <laughs> five footers, anyways. They, so what you're trying to say is. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty snappy. So yeah. I'm I've I've got some trepidation about that. But so it's a funny it's a funny life to it's a very peculiar life to be involved in and I'm not exactly ever sure what to make of it on a day to day basis. But it does give well, me it's a most to peculiar. To so that's what's most thing. peculiar for you is that you were not famous for most of your adult life. And then over the last four years you've been catapulted and become one of the most famous, if not the most famous, psychologists on the planet Earth. Yes, it's very disconcerting. It's hard to get it. It's actually rather hard to adjust to that. I mean, maybe it's a function of age. I found, you know, when, when I was younger and I, I used to move from place to place, take me about a year to adapt. Eh? But I also noticed that as I got older, every time I moved, it took me longer to adapt. By the time mm. you're 56, you know, if you know someone for 10 years, it's like you feel like you're just starting to get to know them a bit. You know, when you're 17, you have a roommate for six months, and it's like your best friends for the rest of your life. So right. it is a very difficult thing to adapt to. I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't really wrap my mind around it. And it, I guess it's also partly because it's true no matter where I go. Like, I went to Slovenia, you know, and it's – everybody speaks English in Slovenia, by the way. And you are a big hit in Slovenia. I don't know if you know this, but – I, I, it looks to me like the podcast YouTube world has even more impact in places where the press is not very reliable. Mm. And so, like everybody knew sense. about our, everybody knew about our interviews and our podcasts. And so <clears throat> I was stopped in Slovenia constantly, which is, that was a real shock too. So, but the, yeah, so the shock is, and this is the weird thing about YouTube and about podcasts is that it's not, it's just not one country or two countries. It's like every damn country. And so it's, but I'm, I'm really fortunate. I'm really fortunate because like I said, all the public encounters I have are, are extremely positive. They're hard to cope with though, you know, in some sense, because people are always, they always tell me a serious story. You know, they say, I was in some sort of hell of some sort six months ago, too much drugs or alcohol or bad relationship or, not get along with my family or underemployed or nihilistic or depressed, whatever, you know, like whatever little corner of hell they have to occupy. And they've been practicing something like maybe developing a vision for their life or trying to live a more meaningful life or taking more responsibility or, or like really making an effort to pull their families together um, and, to, and to, to advance at work regardless of what their job is. And, and it's working. And so they're always like shell shocked that it's working and thrilled to death. But, it's so f strange to have these intense 20 second, 30 second conversations with people about really deep elements of their life. And then, you know, it's, it's a shock. And then you walk along the street and it's a normal day. And then someone else comes up and does the same thing. It's like, I don't know what to do with it emotionally. It's, it's cause maybe, you know, someone might tell you that, I don't know, maybe they tell you that something if you're, you've been helping them maybe they tell you that once a year or once every five years or something but to have it happen all the time is i don't know it i think it fills me with a kind of sorrow like i'm really happy that it's happening and everything but there's still something about it that's deeply and 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 deeply moving and difficult to adjust to so and the Maybe. sorrow because so many people are struggling out there and that you're encountering yeah. all these folks? Well, the sorrow is that there's so many people struggling out there and 
they don't have the sort of they they have so little support that my lectures and podcasts in the book were what was necessary to help them straighten themselves out it's like you know you just can't imagine how many people out there haven't heard an encouraging word you know yeah. so it's like they're home on the what's the old song and home on the range yeah Except that's where you don't hear a discouraging word well these people have never heard an encouraging word and that's it's sad to see how common that is and how little it takes to re- turn that around and it's so fun out in the lectures because you know a lot of the people in my lectures are crack they're the same people you were talking about that stop you in hollywood you know they're kind of rough working class guys that'd be about 30 percent of my audience i would think you know and they're not the sort of people that you would stereotypically presume would come to an hour and a half lecture on you know philosophy and psychology but man they're listening they're listening like mad and it's so fun and interesting to watch them think it through and to and to take this seriously and you know and they come up afterwards and they say you know i've been watching your lectures and i'm a much better husband or i'm a much better father and sometimes they have their girlfriend or wife with them and she says the same thing and you know it's really nice man it's really something yeah well you really are making a giant impact and it's only understandable that it would be difficult for you to wrap your head around what this is and it's it's not something that very few human beings ever get to experience it's a very 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 tiny percentage of our population uh worldwide is ever put in a position like you're put into so yeah, i well, so speak, let's look at your position i mean i asked you this at one time so you you last time we talked i think you were getting something about <coughs> 100 million downloads a, a month on your podcast what are your yeah. figures if you didn't if you don't mind, what do you double that? Like? Oh, <coughs> double that. Yeah, it's Jesus crazy. Christ. That's just unbelievable. Especially with YouTube, with the uh, YouTube and all the YouTube clips. And it's, it's, it's actually probably more than that. It's nuts. I, it's gotten to the point where I try to pay as little attention to the numbers as possible and just concentrate on doing the show. Because what? I think if I pay attention to it too much, <clears throat> Excuse me. I think if I pay attention to it too much, I might lose my mind. I mean, it's just it's, it's untenable. That's just the sheer volume of human beings. When you if you if you were ever on a stage and you were looking out at three hundred million people, what would that look like? I mean, it's not three hundred million people because it's three hundred million downloads in a month. But the the real number of human beings you're interacting with. I mean, I don't know what that is. Is it fifty million people? I don't know how many actual million people are listening to the show or watching the show on a regular basis, but it's an unmanageable number in terms of like reading comments or trying to pay attention to what they want or what they don't want. It's uh, it's very strange. Yes. It's a very weird, it's a very weird position to be in. There's no doubt. And the strange thing is too, is that, well, we've talked about this before too. Like this is early days, right? I mean, th- this has only been happening for about, how long have you been doing your YouTube videos? The YouTube videos are only a few years. It's, I think it's only three or four years. The podcast will be 10 years in December. Right. Okay. So 10 years, that's starting to become a decent chunk of life. But three or four years, that's still new. And yeah. then, I mean, the podcast market and the YouTube market are still, they're brand new technologies fundamentally. And yeah, so- fundamentally. And now you're seeing corporations trying to capitalize on it. and. And I've started to get these very bizarre offers to make my podcast exclusive on this platform or that platform. And, you know, these, these companies are, they're throwing crazy amounts of money around at podcast uh, like uh, networks, hundreds of millions of dollars to buy podcast networks. So it's, it's, it's becoming very, very strange because what was a joke five or six years ago, literally like, why are you wasting your time doing a podcast? I used to hear that all the time. Now it's, how did you do this? How did you make this podcast so popular? That yeah. get a totally different question. Yeah, well, Very so, well, it's so strange because so many people have, nobody realized that there was a, <clears throat> an audience for on-demand audio. And you see the same not thing that, in the book world, not right? Not only that, but not just on-demand audio, but long-form conversation. Yeah. One of the, I mean, even my friend Ari, who's one of my best friends, would always tell me, you got to edit your shows. Nobody wants to listen to anything that's three hours long. So I'd say, well, then they don't have to listen. 
And he's like, ah, you like you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. And I'm like, I don't think I am. Like, why not? If, if someone only has an hour, then listen to it for an hour. Like you're not going to, I mean, you might miss out some information, but it's not going to change your life. Like do whatever you want to do. But I like talking to people for long periods of time because I think you really only get cooking after like the first half hour, 40 minutes. That's when you get comfortable. You sort of get a, into a groove of communication, you, you know, of figuring out this person's rhythm and thought processes. And it, you, you, and then as you expand on these ideas and you share information back and forth with each other, after an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, that's when things really start getting deep. And oftentimes the last hour of a three-hour podcast is the best hour. Yeah, well, that intuition was certainly right and revolutionary. You never know when you come up with a revolutionary idea. You know, yeah, I mean, was- part of my revolutionary idea is just me being stubborn. It's just like I didn't care. I wasn't doing it for money. So the only reason why I was doing it is because I enjoy talking to people like you or many of my other guests. I, I want to talk to – it's a very rare opportunity where I would get a chance to sit down with someone like you with no distractions, no other people in the room, no cell phones, and just talk for yeah. three hours. Yeah. That's so unusual in our world and our constantly distracted world. And I think I've gotten, gotten a fantastic education because of that. I mean, it's really enlightened me on so many different subjects and expanded my understanding of people in general. And, and conspiracy uh, theories. I mean, man, you're up on those. Like, no <laughs> yeah, I've got some of those too. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's it's sure. important to be up on the conspiracy theories just to keep track of the damn things. Well, so, you got to know what people think of you. You know, yeah. I've, I've been lately, I'm a Zionist shill. This is the re- more, more, re- most recent one. I didn't know it was a Zionist shill. Oh, yeah. You're a Zionist shill. Yeah. I'm a white supremacist, too, depending on who you ask. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got those two things as well. So and that, <laughs> and it's like it's real interesting to be able to juggle both of those identities. It's like, yeah, good Zionist luck with that. Shill one day, white supremacist the next. It's sort of like yeah. being gender fluid, except on the political spectrum. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why, why do you have to be conservative or Democrat? You know, sometimes you're one and sometimes you're the other. It depends on the day. And there's no reason yeah. to extend that, like, all the way out to the edges, you know. So. Yeah, gender fluid is my favorite. That's my favorite thing that's going on right now, where someone could be, like, a, a woman for a few hours and then be a man for the next six. You know, I <laughs> read... Back and forth. I read, although I don't know if this is true, but I... But I read it several places, and I actually looked. I read that the Olympic Committee is going to let trans people compete in the Olympics in the next competition. I'm not surprised because the Olympic, the IOC, the Olympic Committee, is uh, incredibly corrupt. And uh, I think what they do, first of all, is disgraceful. Uh, They make billions of dollars. The athletes make zero. I think it's disgusting. I think everything about what they do is corrupt and the idea that they're there for fair and, 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 and pure competition is nonsense. They're there to make shitloads of money and that's what they're good at. And what they're good at doing is putting on these gigantic events where they profit in in spectacular and staggering ways. And the athletes dedicate their entire life to these moments and they literally make nothing. And then after that, if they're lucky, if they're very famous and popular, they can eke out a living with uh, endorsements. Right. Or, you know, for the rare person like Michael Phelps or someone like that, who's just a true outlier, they can actually get wealthy from it. But it's very, very rare. Uh, most of those athletes will be in severe debt. Most of those athletes either have to get sponsored or they have to find someone who is willing to uh, share the burden and, and help them achieve their goals. But Without some sort of altruistic uh, benefactor who's got millions of dollars to pour into their camp, I mean, it's just, it's disgusting. They're they're professional athletes. I mean, that's what they do with their entire life. If you want to win a gold medal in the Olympics in gymnastics, you can't have a side job. You can't be (laughs) working eight hours a day. No, No, you have to be a professional athlete. And the Olympic Committee knows this. And and if you've ever paid attention to how – they've let people get away with cheating. I mean, there's a fantastic documentary out right now um, by Brian Fogel called Icarus. And it's all about the Sochi Olympics 
and how Russia cheated in the Sochi Olympics and the IOC barely punished them. They, they punished a few people and how the IOC and the World Anti-Doping Agency all, they have people from each, they have from each organization, they share, like they go back and forth. They work for one and they work for the other. And they're, they're totally in conflict. It's a total conflict of interest. And it's a, it's a dirty business. So if the tide of political uh, perception is that it's a good progressive thing to have trans women competing in the UFC, or not in the UFC, I shouldn't say the UFC, because that'll never happen, but trans women competing in the Olympics, and that this was uh, what everybody wanted, they would just do it. They would do it regardless of whether or not it's fair, regardless of whether or not it made sense. And they would do it just to get more eyes on the show, just to get more money. And that's, you know, that's what they're there for. That's what they're good at. It's fascinating to see how all that plays out because it's so absurd. I was looking, I looked up some stats the other day because I was curious, you know, it's like, okay, I know that all the differences between men and women are socially constructed, but nonetheless, I went and looked up the biological comparison of strength, you know, and the typical woman has 30% of the upper body strength of the typical man and about 55% of the lower body strength. Now, that's like, that's a big difference, man. That makes the average man three times as strong in the upper body. Jesus, that gives you an advantage that's just, well, it's criminal. So it, it, Well, also, it is, but the, the question is, how much do you lose from the conversion? How well, much you do you lose some. from estrogen? You lose some. But if a woman, say, look, if you have an athlete who's a woman who's 32 years old, and it turns out that she's been taking steroids her entire adult life, so she's been taking steroids for 12 years every day and then decides to stop taking them right before the Olympics. Wouldn't everybody agree that she has a massive advantage? Wouldn't everybody agree that most likely her tendon strength, her muscle strength, her bone structure, all of that has been completely altered by taking performance-enhancing drugs? We would all agree to that. Well, guess what? That's what you're doing if you're a man for 30 years and then you decide to transition and become a woman for two, even if you're taking estrogen, even well, if you other, go through the this. thing I don't you, understand is, apart from the obvious unfairness of that, uh, what, what I struggle with understanding is the triumphalism of the victors. It's yeah. like they, they enter these contests and then they win. And then they celebrate their victory as if it's a genuine victory, despite the fact right. that they wiped out these women who've been working mostly within the rules for like, you know, maybe not decades, but certainly many, many years in succession. And they just blow them away, especially in like strength contests. And then they, they actually treat that like they won. And then they also claim it as a moral victory. You know, and for me, that, that's just... That I, the only th the only thing I see in that is a narcissism that's so deep that it's almost unfathomable. It's like how can you take pride in that sort of victory unless you don't see who it is that you're defeating? I don't get it. Well, it it shows how pathological this whole thing really is when you're when you're dealing with the idea that you can turn. Uh, a person into someone of the opposite gender, not just recognize them as being a woman and treat them as a woman and allow them to use whatever name they would like. I'm all for that. But it's that you are going to say, no, this is a woman and she should be able to compete with women, including in combat sports, rugby. There's a, a male to female trans athlete in, that plays rugby in Australia that's 240 pounds. And just smashing women. And I don't think there's any real standards that are universal in terms of like, what do you have to go through in terms of your conversion therapy? And like, what, what about size differences when you're dealing with uh, high impact sports? No, because that's sports. a political minefield. Like the, right, the, exactly. the radical end of it is, well, you're the gender that you say you are and the yes. medical conversion is irrelevant. And I don't know how that translates into the sports world, but my sense is that if the same thing happens in the sports world that's happened in the political world, that it will be basically indistinguishable from whim. It's like, well, now I'm a woman. 
It's yeah, like, I had argue. a guy on my podcast recently, and this this came up, and it was a big argument. And he his essentially his stance was he is all for inclusiveness, and he wants uh, he he would like to move towards a world where trans athletes can compete and they're included and they can compete as women. And I was trying to explain the, the benefits of being a male, the physical benefits of being a male and competing against women. And, you know, he just didn't want to hear it. It was just in denial of it. It was, it was, uh, it was going against these preconceived notions that he had and that this, and the ideology there's a part of progressive ideology that is you're supposed to look at a trans woman as every bit a woman. Yeah, well, that's because you're supposed to accept the doctrine that all differences between men and women are socially constructed, which is, of course, an, a doctrine that's, I think, nonsense. it's delusional. Yeah, it's nonsense. It's, yes. it's, and it's delusional for some even deeper reason that's even harder to fathom. And I don't know what it is. I, yeah, it is hard to fathom. I don't, I don't understand the root of it. I really don't. I, I, even when I talk to people who subscribe to these notions, I don't understand the logic. I don't understand where's, where's the breakdown in their perception of the world where they don't see. And well, another thing that we got into. Don't go, go ahead. No, saying another thing that we got into was ch children transition. Oh, yeah. And then he was informed, the form, oh, I keep hearing this. This is something that I keep hearing that's driving me mad. That hormone blockers, that these puberty blockers are reversible. They keep saying that they're like, they're harmless. They're reversible. If the child changes their mind, they could always just get off the bar and the, the results are reversible. That's not true. You're affecting the development of a child. If you're using these hormone blockers, you are changing the way the child is going to develop because they're not going to have testosterone the way a normal boy would if they're transitioning from male to female. If you're doing this to a six-year-old kid, the, the, the notion that this is completely reversible is completely disingenuous because that child is not going to go through the same developmental period physically as they would if they had access to testosterone. They're just not. It's just not true. It's not true if you talk to medical doctors. It's not true if you talk to biologists. It's just, it's just not true. And it's something that they use to try to justify the, in air quotes, harmlessness of this particular type of therapy that they're encouraging. Yeah. And it's just, it's just to say that there's nothing wrong with being trans. And I don't think there is anything wrong with being trans. But I think there is something wrong with making decisions for a child or allowing a child to make decisions that will massively impact them for the rest of their life and to make that decision when you're six. Like I could only imagine if I was a person who had gone through that and then having this conversation with my parents going, why the fuck did you let me make that decision? Well, it's going to be really interesting to see that play itself out in the courts in about 12 years. Oh, it's going to be ugly. It's it going to be ugly. Be, and it's, it's going to be ugly, man. Because, oh, yeah, I mean, in, you, don't let, you don't let your damn six-year-old get a tattoo. Right, exactly. I mean, and the tattoo is fairly reversible. The whole thing about it is nonsense. And it's, it's this whole progressive ideology that they're subscribing to. There's a doctrine. Like, you have to – there's all these different things that you have to subscribe to if you want to accept that ideology. And yeah. this is one of them. Yeah. This is Little one of them. Trans children. children. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Trans, trans children. You can't, you can't say, yeah, that is problematic. You can't, you're not allowed to say that. You can't no. even entertain the notion that this could be a particularly egregious offense uh, on a child if they decide that that was a bad idea. Well, I guess you, you know, you, you kind of, if the primary idea is that our society is an oppressive patriarchy, and I think that's like number one idea then anything that touches on that in any way immediately becomes untouchable. And so in order yes. for the adults to make the decision, then you have to believe in authority because the adults have the authority. And if you're going to believe that the adults have the authority, then you have to believe that hierarchy has some value. And then that tangles you up with your insistence that, you know, hierarchy is definitely oppressive and, and the, especially the Western form of hierarchy. And so I think, that central axiom is so vital that anything that gets near it gets twisted and bent like it's too close to a gravitational field and, and the logic is irrelevant because that fundamental central issue has to be 
uh, support it at all costs. Well, this is one of the conundrums of our conversation. One of the, the we, we came to this one point where I said, now, if a child identifies as a girl, I said, why not just let them be a girl? Why do you have to fuck with their hormones? Why do you have to right, if it's socially engage with their body? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it's all nonsense. Well, I mean, I, this is my take on all of this. Like, be, just be a girl. Anything where you need That's medical reversible. science to consistently, yeah, right? Anything where you need medical science to consistently inject chemicals into your body that are going to alter your hormones irreversibly at a very young age. Like, why, why is that natural? Why are you saying this is, the, this is what, what this person biologically or psychologically needs? Are you sure? This seems well, that's like something that human beings have constructed. Well, it's particularly damn weird if you insist that gender is a social construct. Yes. It's like, if yes. it's a social yes. construct, then what the hell are the hormones for? Exactly. So, that was my point. Yeah. And he didn't have an answer to that. No, no, that's, 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 a, a, that's a rough one, man. That's, that's yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to go back to Boston. So okay. Start, okay. So you said that's really where things started for you. So you moved there when you yes. were 13. And so what did you get involved in? First of all, like what kind of kid were you in school? Uh, barely paid attention. I was, uh, I, if, if ADD is real, I certainly had it. Um, and I was very, very interested in what I was interested in. I was very uninterested in people telling me what to do. And uh, right. I essentially couldn't wait to get out of school. But I would excel at things that I had interest in. And the, initially it was art. I, was, uh, I wanted to be a comic book illustrator until um, I really got into martial arts. And martial arts became the focus of my life. Around 14, 15 years old, that's when I really became massively obsessed. And that was really the first thing that I ever did where I, I really didn't feel like a loser. Like I really felt like, oh, I actually have some talent. There's, there's, I actually can be exceptional. There's like something, because you know, I grew up constantly moving didn't really have a lot of friends. I would be new in this town. I'd get picked on. I wasn't a big kid. And there was a lot of, a lot of issues with that psychologically. And uh, I didn't like being afraid of other kids. I didn't like not knowing what to do. If I ran into kids, they were going to bully me and pick on me. So uh, I learned. Yeah, well, that's an annoying thing not to know what to do about. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, martial arts changed that 180 degrees. And then it, I became someone who I would be afraid of. You know, be, I became the opposite of what I was. So what I was was someone who was terrified of conflict, didn't know what to do. And what I became was, you know, a, a Taekwondo champion. I became a martial arts champion. I, I knew how to fight. So I how did done you, it so what many ha- times. What, so, like, what did you do? You just walked into a, a joint one day and decided that that's what you were going to do? Like, how did it come about? It was very fortunate. Well, I'd done a little bit of martial arts training at a different place. And then one day I was in Boston for a uh, Red Sox game at Fenway Park. And as I was walking home to the train station uh, with a friend of mine, um, there was a lot of people that were leaving the baseball game. So the lines from the train for the T, uh, which in in Boston, um, public transportation was very long. So uh, we decided to go check out the Jay Hun Kim Taekwondo Institute. It's right there. And I had been really into martial arts because of what I said, you know, my, the aforementioned insecurities. And so I went up the stairs. And as I was walking up the stairs, just fortuitously, a guy named John Lee was training. And John was a national Taekwondo champion who was uh, pr- in preparation for the World Cup which was this huge event that he was taking, the international event that he was about to travel to go to. And uh, he was in the peak of his training. And so I walked up to the top of the stairs and I, I heard this crazy sound of this, what it turned out to be this man kicking this bag and slamming his heel into this bag and having the chain snap and, and rattle and the, the, the thud of his heel slamming into this leather bag. And I got up there and I watched this guy work out. I couldn't believe a person could do that. I'd never seen anybody kick something so hard in real life. Anybody that had such incredible martial arts skill like this guy did, John Lee, who became a mentor of mine and, and, and taught me quite a bit. 
but uh, that changed everything. I was there the next day. I talked to them. They gave me a brochure and a pamphlet, <clears throat> and I was there the next day, and I was probably there every day of my life, um, give or take a few days here or there if I was injured or something came up until I was uh, 22 years old. Hmm. So how many hours a day were you spending there? All day. I had keys pretty quickly. Um, they gave me keys. Uh, they wanted me, well, right away, my instructor recognized that I was pretty obsessed and I was uh, physically pretty talented. So he uh, had me teaching classes uh, instead of paying. He was like, like, if it's difficult for you to pay, I'd like to have you teach. And there was some wisdom to that, too, because one of the best ways for someone to get good at martial arts is actually to teach. Um, you, you actually refines your technique. You, you think about it more. You're explaining sure. it to people that don't necessarily understand all the mechanics of it. So I started teaching. I would teach private lessons to beginners. I would teach group classes. And then eventually I went on to teach at Boston University. I taught at Boston University in, when I was 19. I was teaching a accredited class there. But you actually mm. it counted towards your GPA. Hmm. And so uh, I did that. That was I was already U.S. Open champion by then. And, how uh, how long did it take? So you went in there when you were thirteen, and you were a kid that was had moved around a bunch and got pushed. I was fourteen down. or fifteen by the time I got to that school. Okay, uh, and, and then yeah. I had my black belt by the time I was seventeen, and I was uh, competing in the adult division by then. Before I was ever eighteen, I was competing as an adult. Uh, I mean, he might have even put me in when I was 16, if I don't, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then I won the state championship when I was 18, and I won it every year um, from then until I stopped. Right. So you had a pretty, so you had won a pretty four years successful in a row. run at it there. How long did it take before? Like, were you, were you still, were you a thin, like, you were you a skinny kid when you started? How, when did you start to bulk up and get big? When did you start well, to get um, tough enough so that? you know, the problems with aggression stop, you know, with other people's aggression stop being a, being a trouble for you. Well, luckily with high school, kids heard about it right away. You know, it was one of those things where, you know, you find out that there's some, one of, you, one of the kids you go to school with is flying all over the country, kicking people in the head. You right. Know, they, they just avoided me. Yeah, yeah right. I became, right. it wasn't like, you know, I, I mean, I, I certainly never sought out trouble, but people avoided me like you know junior and senior year I'd already become this weird kid that was obsessed with martial arts you know and I spent you know most of my life from the time I was 15 till I was 21 training and competing I probably fought over 100 times I traveled all over the country I fought in California I fought in Ohio I fought I fought all over the place and, and right. a lot of local tournaments in Connecticut and Massachusetts and New Hampshire is where I won the U S open. And I, I, you know, just fought everywhere. And that was, that was most that was of life. my life. Yeah. That was most of my life until I got into stand up comedy. Right. So that was, so you had a very singular life. Like that's, that's yeah, a hundred percent singular, yeah. uniquely singular, but I avoided most of the pitfalls of high school partying and all that stuff. I didn't do that because I was scared of getting hurt. I was scared that right. if I showed up for training hung over that I'd get beat up uh, and that it would somehow, know, I was scared of anything that would take even a tiny bit away from my performance as a fighter because I was obsessed was that, with it. Was that scared, scared of, was that actually fear of, of, of being hurt because you made a mistake or fear of losing the competition or fear of not fear of being, being hurt, hurt, fear of losing hurt? the competition? fear of hurt, being hurt in training. Training alone was as scary as any competition. I just, just complete, completely by luck, wandered into one of the best schools in the world for Taekwondo. It, 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 um, they had produced multiple national champions and uh, you know, real top of the food chain athletes in terms of Taekwondo. And it was just, just dumb luck that I walked into that school. And, you know, I could have walked into another school that was a few blocks away that was terrible. I mean, just, right. I just got lucky. I got really, really, really lucky. So how useful, how useful are the technical martial arts like Taekwondo and like in an actual street fight? Not that useful. I mean, more useful than knowing nothing, 
but um, not as useful as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Or um, now, I, a lot of people now are just learning mixed martial arts, right. which is essentially what you see in the UFC, where they're a jack of all trades, master of none. And the argument, there's two arguments. Like there's, ar there's an argument that that is a good thing to learn. And then there's other arguments that being a specialist first is the best thing. And then learning the other things later in life is the best way to go about it. Like a specialist, particularly a striker or a grappler, like being an elite wrestler or an elite jujitsu artist, and then learning all the other stuff later in life, because you have such a significant advantage if you can bring the fight into your realm of expertise. So if you are a striker, every fight starts standing up. And if you're an elite striker and you know how to avoid takedowns and you know how to wrestle enough to keep a guy off you, you'll have such a significant advantage striking that you can dominate the competition. And we've seen that in the UFC. We've seen that with both grappling and with, uh, with striking. That it seems that if you become a specialist in one particular area and then learn those other things, you'll be better off. But there, you can't really just be a specialist, whether it's in Muay Thai or Taekwondo or Jiu Jitsu, you really kind of have to understand if you're a, a grappler, you really have kind of have to understand striking. And if you're a striker, you really kind of have to understand grappling in order to at least avoid it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and so during this time too, I mean, you, you got to be a pretty big guy. So when did that start happening? Were you working out like mad while you were training as well? Like, let yeah, but I was in. much thinner. I was much thinner back then. I didn't do much weightlifting because I was trying to compete in certain weight classes. Like wow. uh, when I was 17, was one, it was the, I was cutting weight when I was 17 and 18. I was trying to make the 140 pound weight class, but I was really probably about 10 pounds plus heavier than that. And I would dehydrate myself and it was really affecting my performance. And then when I was 18, I moved up to the next weight class. That was 154, I believe it was. And when I moved up to that weight class, I got way better. That was when ah. I really excelled. That's when I became like a, a real national class athlete was when I moved up. And, um, I w but I still wasn't lifting weights much. I was just doing Taekwondo training. It was just a lot of heavy bag work, some calisthenics, but mostly it was martial arts work. Then when I started getting into jujitsu, it was long after I stopped competing. That's when I started really getting into weightlifting. Because jujitsu uh, involves grappling, and I think the, the advantage to being strong in grappling is pretty significant. Right, It's right. gigantic. And so that's when, you know, I was like 29 or so like that. That's when I really started heavily weightlifting and, and, and okay, so really that was getting into that. Okay, so that was quite a bit later. How long did your initial martial arts career last? I fought from the time I was 15, and I think I had my last fight. It was either I was 21 or 22. I don't really remember those. But the last three fights were kickboxing fights. And I had those while I was doing stand-up comedy. So I was, I, was, I was spreading myself too thin. I was working a bunch of different jobs. I was working delivering newspapers. I was working as a private investigator's assistant. I did some construction. I did a bunch of different odd jobs to make a living. And uh, I had decided well, kind of somewhere along. Newspaper, yeah. delivery boy, construction agent, jujitsu fighter, stand-up comedian. <laughs> you know, that's kind of your typical 19-year-old situation. Yeah, well, jujitsu came later. Jujitsu didn't come until I was, uh, I think I was 28 or 29 when I first started training jujitsu. Mm. Um, those, that was mostly just taekwondo and kickboxing. I really got into kickboxing. And I was... And I had three kickboxing fights and I was entertaining the idea of fighting professionally, but I was also starting to get really worried about brain damage. Uh, I started to see some from signs kick, from kickboxing specifically. Yeah, specifically because it was, I was getting hit a lot more. Oh yeah. Um, the, the kickboxing sparring that I did, I did that over the course of about two years where I really got heavily into kickboxing. I did a lot of boxing sparring and a lot of what you would call gym wars where guys would just, we would beat the shit out of each other and you'd get hurt and you'd come home with headaches and you basically were fighting in the gym. I mean, it's not a wise way to do it. The, the smart gyms now and the best martial artists, they very rarely spar hard. They, most of the time they spar technically. So they're, they're hitting each other, but they hit each other like this. They don't, they don't blast each other full blast. They sort of touch each other. They're working on timing and occasionally you go hard just to make sure that you, you can survive 
with these techniques in a firefight that you know how to deal with it once you get hit. But um, we didn't. Right, and is the, the lo- is the lower combat intensity still in, mm-hmm. still useful for training for the real thing? Yes, it's it's. But you have to have some high intensity, and some people they have that high intensity. They actually have drills that they use to to sort of st- um, to simulate actual uh, exchanges that you would have. There's a lot of science to it now that didn't exist back then. the The gyms that I came up in were real hard nose really you know tough gyms and right, right. if you if you weren't tough you did not survive and they weren't interested in anybody that couldn't take a shot or anybody that wasn't willing to go to war so you would put on a mouthpiece you put on a cup you put your shin pads on and you beat the fuck out of each other and that was a big part of uh learning how to fight it was these sparring sessions were brutal they were nerve-wracking you'd be scared You'd be scared going into them. They'd be, uh, you know, I'd you'd be anxious the night before if I knew how to spar a particular guy the next day because I knew it was dangerous. You basically were having fights all the time. So I'd have fights several days a week. You would fight. You know, right. it wasn't really sparring. You'd hit, I'd hit guys Christ, as hard you, as I could. You're covering a lot too, man, all the time, yeah. I think, from that. So, okay, yeah, you're just a big hole in this story too. So, like, you're doing great at Taekwondo. You've got your national level athlete. and you switch to kickboxing, you're worried about getting hurt, and that seems reasonable because, like, how about not being brain damaged by the time you're 30? But then, you know, I guess part of what I'm wondering was, like, how many shots in the head did you have to take before you thought being a stand-up comedian was a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one of my dear friends to this day is a guy named Steve Graham. And... uh Steve was, uh, when I met him, I was 15 and he was probably 30 and he was going through his residency as an ophthalmologist and, um, he had been a flight surgeon in the U S air force and just, uh, he would, he had been on the U S ski team. He was a national skiing champion, just a wild man just a guy who took chances and lived life to the fullest and was uh, just one of the most hardworking people I ever met in my life. And uh, I would make him laugh and I would make some of the people laugh in training because we were always nervous. Every, when we would go to tournaments, we were nervous because, you know, I'd seen many of my friends get knocked unconscious at these tournaments, get kicked in the head, and taken to hospitals. And, you know, I'd seen it in the gym too. A lot of guys getting beat up and knocked out in the gym. It was constant and you know and you know and it happened to me a couple of times i'd been hurt and so we had this gallows humor mm-hmm. where um we would go to these events we would travel to these tournaments and everybody would be the tension would be so thick everybody would just d- taking deep breaths and trying to relax and just stay loose before you fight and i would be the i would be the class clown mm-hmm. in that environment and had you, you know, ever and seen also, any of that when you were in high school or junior high? Like, would you? No, play? I didn't no. have that. So, no, but it took I did, those I circumstances. Did, yes, I did have a sense of humor, but it would manifest itself in cartoons. I would draw like cartoons of the teacher. You know, I would like uh, draw cartoons of like certain kids that would kiss the teacher's ass. I would draw them like kissing the teacher's ass and saying ridiculous things. And if the teacher was late to a class, and you know, and I knew I had enough time, I would put something on the chalkboard and then pull down the screen so that when they would go to use the chalkboard, the chalkboard, they would pull the screen back up and see this ridiculous cartoon that I had drawn. The whole class would laugh. And then you know, the teacher would ask who did this. And luckily nobody ratted me out. But, uh, so I, that I enjoyed making people laugh, but, uh, that was, it wasn't, it wasn't most, it mostly wasn't things I said it was mostly right. cartoons. Right. But right. Then That's when, very different. Yeah. Yeah, but with comedy, with 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 the the fighting, when we were getting ready to compete, I was just trying to add some levity. I was just trying to lighten up the mood because yeah. everybody was, and it was also it was a charged environment. So anything that I said that was actually funny would get a giant reaction, and that became addictive. And I was pretty good at doing impressions. So I do impressions of our friends, do impressions of our instructor, all these in ridiculous situations and my friend steve graham and my other friend ed shorter who's another one encouraged me who i lost touch with unfortunately um he he said you should be a comedian 
And my take on it was, you think I'm funny because you're my friend, uh, but other people are going to think I'm an asshole. Like the things that I think are funny are fucked up. Right. Like I have a fucked up sense of humor. I mean, here I am devoting most of my time to trying to get really good at knocking people unconscious. I mean, that's what I was, that was, that was what I was trying to do. I was trying to separate people from their consciousness. That was, I was doing my best every day to get good at that. So my it's like a really of, perverse psychedelic drug. Yeah, it was, a, it was the worst. Yeah. But it was, I was trying to hurt people. That's what I was trying to get good at. I was trying to get good at hurting human bodies. And I just didn't think, I thought that I was such an, uh, such a weirdo and such an outlier in terms of like how society viewed uh, combat, physical comp- hand-to-hand combat and interactions with each other that no one would think that the things that I was making fun of were funny. And this guy convinced me to go to an open mic night. He's like, you should go to an open mic night. Just go. There's a lot of comedy clubs in Boston. Go and watch. And I went and watched. And I realized, wow, one of the things about going to open mic night is most open mic comedians are so terrible that it encourages you to try it. Because uh-huh. you're like, well, I can't be that bad. Like, it, it, I, I might have something that's better than some of these people. And then, you know, you'd see a real professional go up and you'd, it would be so discouraging because you'd say, like, God, my God, I'll never be that funny. That, that guy's impossibly funny. Uh, but I knew from martial arts that if I worked really hard at something, I could get good at it. And I had this thought that maybe I could do that with comedy because I didn't want to fight anymore. I was already, I was already on my way kind of out the door. I was really worried about the brain dead. I was on my way out the door from the time I was like 19. From the time I was 19, I was starting to worry about brain damage. And then, well, so you're how like you're fifty three? I'm fifty one. Fifty one, fifty one, and so much. How much damage did you actually sustain? You know, like lots of people. I don't do. know. I don't know. I mean, uh, I seem how to about, be okay. How about physically, muscularly, and that sort of thing? Oh no, I'm fine. I had a bunch well, of surgeries. Good. I've had my nose repaired. My nose was destroyed. I, I had no nose. Like the inside of my nose was just didn't work until I was 40. And then I, I had a deviated septum operation. They had to cut out giant calcified chunks of scar tissue and all sorts of, I literally, my nose was useless until I was 40 years old. Um, so that, that had, must be kind of a relief to have your nose. Oh my God. I tell everybody, <laughs> get it done. If you have a deviated septum and you can't breathe out of your nose, my God, this, <sighs> I couldn't do that until I was 40. Yeah. And it was just all broke. I had broke my nose who knows how many times, at least a dozen. And it would just was always bloody. I was always getting punched or kicked in the nose. Yeah, it doesn't um, seem designed as a sense organ to be at the, in the middle of your face where you get punched. Well, it has this little tiny piece of cartilage too. It should be on the top of your head, you know, be a lot (laughs) safer out there. Yeah. Like a whale. It also makes your eyes swell shut. It makes your eyes water. It makes it difficult to see when you get hit in the nose. Getting hit in the nose is, is really annoying. Um, but other than that, I had both my knees reconstructed. I had ACL tears in both knees. I had to get them, them reconstructed and, you know, a bunch oh, of yeah. other stuff. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. So you took your – A bunch of other your, broken things. Yeah, you broken yourself up pretty good. Feet. Yeah, broken knuckles. And I, I broke a lot of stuff. Uh-huh. But, uh, but everything works great now. I mean, after surgery and I mean, for a person who's been through what I do, what I've done with my body, my body works remarkably well. Yeah, it's amazing, and, actually. You know, that's a lot. Yeah. You, know, you think you'd be arthritic, at least in some of your joints and that sort of thing. No, I'm, I'm pretty good. I mean, I also am very proactive. I do a lot of yoga. I've had a bunch of stem cell therapies to deal with uh, some significant tears and injuries that I've had. But all that you know, knock on wood, everything works pretty good. But the brain damage thing is, I don't know. I really don't know. I really sit, th- sit back and think about some of those wars that I was in. Yeah. The gym wars in particular and some fights. And my last fight, I got TKO'd. I got stopped. I got hit with a left hook and dropped. And uh, my legs went out from under me. And then I got up and I get hit again, fell down again. They stopped the fight. And uh, that was when I decided I'm going to stop. I was like, I'm not giving this the same amount of dedication I gave when I was at my best. I was spreading myself way too thin with comedy. And I, I just didn't, 
I didn't have this same hunger for it that I had when I was young or younger. And I was also very aware of the consequences at that point in my life. I was like this, I know where this is going. I, I, I saw guys at the gym that were punch drunk, you know, uh-huh. that were right. slurring their words and they would forget things. And, and I had seen some people progress towards that. And it was very, very disturbing to me. You know, I'd be lying in bed at night after a hard sparring session. My head would be pounding. Uh-huh. And I would think, what am I doing to my fucking brain? Like, what am I doing to myself? And um, I got real lucky that I found stand-up comedy. I mean, if the UFC was around back then, I most certainly would have started fighting. And, uh, you know, and, and to not be training intelligently, because I wasn't training intelligently. I was training like a meathead. And that was just all we knew back then. I probably would have sustained some pretty significant damage before I ever even got into the octagon. I probably would have already had massive brain damage before I ever had a fight. Right. Right. So you, so, well, that's good. So you, you stepped out at an intelligent time. And so then you started your comedy career and you started at open mics. And so like, tell me about how that developed. Well, open mic nights are very interesting. You sign up on a list and you may or may not get on. Uh, they, they pick people out of a hat. Like say if there's 50 people sign up, 30 people get on. And, uh, you know, you each do five minutes. And, you know, the, uh, the host is generally a professional comedian that brings people up. And, you know, you have this weird culture of people that are struggling to try to figure out how to make a living in this sort of uh, undefined art form. There's no classes you can take in it that are really worth anything. There's no books that you can buy that are going to teach you anything. It's something that you kind of have to. The only thing that I liken to is rap music because rap music seems to be very similar in the fact that you have to learn from other practitioners. You don't really learn from books. You don't, there's no like, I mean, maybe there is now. I don't know of any like real legitimate university courses on stand-up comedy. Um, I, I don't think they could teach it to you anyway because everyone does it differently. But I think that's the case with rap music as well. I think you kind of have to learn from the people that are already doing it. And one good thing about stand-up comedy, particularly today, uh, today it's much more open and inviting. And um, comedians have a lot more camaraderie than they did in the beginning because they're not fighting over scraps anymore. Now there's so many venues, so many different places to work. And then there's YouTube and the Internet. And um, comedians, there's much more of a supportive community of people trying to help people. And I I try to really concentrate on that. I spend a lot of time trying to help young comics. Uh, I put a lot of young comics on my shows. I have them host. Um, You know, uh, I've got a show tonight and uh, a young comic who's only been doing it for a few years. Her name's uh, Allie Mikofsky. She's the host of it. She's really funny. And I try to encourage them. I try to help them. I try to give them advice. I try to give them pointers. I try to, when they have great sets, I try to, you know, really thank them and say that was excellent and you got this just keep keep doing what you're doing and you can really make a career doing this because it's such a insecure business it's just so it's such a weird undefined path that you have to take and it's, it's and i love the art form i love it as a consumer i love it as a person who's an audience member i really still to this day enjoy watching stand up but back then it wasn't that supportive. There was, you know, we would just support each other, but the, the professionals weren't that supportive. Not like they are today. A few people, like, there's a guy named Lenny Clark that I'm still good friends with to this day. And I, I opened up for him. He was a Boston legend. And I was super fortunate to open up for him when I had been uh, doing comedy for about a year. And he gave me some great advice. And that meant the world to me. And he was actually on my podcast just last month. I love that guy. And, you know, he helped me out when I was really really i was 21 i was really really young in my comedy career and so you started putting the same amount of dedication into that that you had been putting into the martial arts exactly yeah i just became obsessed with it and i just traveled all over the place doing doing open mic nights i mean me and my good friend greg fitzsimmons we started out together we're good friends to this day we started out within a week of each other and um we we used to travel all the way to rhode island we would drive you know, it was an hour plus drive to go down there just to do five minutes. And then we were at an open mic night for free and they would drive all the way home and just dream about one day being a professional. That was the dream. The dream was to pay your bills by doing comedy. Imagine right. if that, that could, you could do comedy for a living. Like that was the dream. 
would I would never imagine that I'm doing what I'm doing now, where I'm doing these sold out arenas like that. That wasn't even a hope. And not it wasn't even like maybe if it goes well, I could do this. Maybe I could do that. That was never on the menu. And you know, it's gotten to this really crazy astronomical place now that it's very hard for me to even imagine that that came out of those strange days in Boston, just traveling around to all these different weird comedy clubs and writing constantly and not knowing how to write, not knowing how to formulate a joke, having like m many more misses than hits, you know, a lot of bombing. I bombed all the time. I, I yeah, well, that's something on stage. as well, man. You, you know, you got to have that ability to, to bomb and come back from it. I mean, cause yeah. you, you're, you're going to have a lot more, Misses than hits. That's for sure. That's an, a lot more. Yeah. So, especially what do you in the think, early days, what do you think accounts for that obsessiveness that you described? I mean, that's a negative way of putting it. I mean, obviously, you said that you know when you were in school, if you weren't interested, you weren't listening at all. But if you were interested in something, you were like laser focused, and that really came up in the martial arts. But it obviously manifested itself in the stand-up comedy too. So, what is it about yeah. you that 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 enables you what do you think it is about you that enables you to zero in on something like that to the exclusion of everything else i don't know i mean i think some of it has to be attributed to the unhappiness of my childhood um that when i would find something that i did get some joy out of i would just concentrate all in on that um mm. i think some of it also was like i wasn't really raised with a lot of discipline and I wasn't really raised with a, a pa I mean, my parents were both, my stepdad and my mom were both working all the time. So they, they didn't, they weren't really around to sort of tell me what to do or how to live. And they weren't really around to let me know that everything was going to be okay. They were always working. So they would come home from work at like six o'clock or something like that. And, you know, I'd been on my own all day. Me and my sister had been on our own all day. You know, we'd come home, we had a key, we got into the house. And it was uh, when I, I, there was a lot of real bad feelings, you know, like, and when I found something that made me feel good, I just did that exclusively. That's all I did. And I, I still have that problem to this day. Uh, when I get obsessed with something, if I find something that means something to me, I, uh, I think of it all day long. If, uh -huh. if I get obsessed with something, it becomes, it becomes uh, like a, a mantra that's in the back of my head. And I, 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 I have to shut it off. Like I have to do my best to shut it off. Otherwise I can't listen to people. I don't li mm -hmm. like, I, like when people are talking to me, I don't want to talk to them. I want to go do that thing that I want to do. Right. Right. You know, right, and it, it becomes right. like a, a compulsion. And it could be socially negative, you know. It could be uh, detrimental to relationships and friendships. Yeah, um, yeah, but it but, seems like that sort of thing is also absolutely necessary if you're going to develop high-level skill at something difficult and unlikely. Because yeah. unless you're obsessive about it and practice it like all the time, the the people you're competing with are gonna they're gonna take you out. So well, the funny thing, I would always be terrified that I would run into someone like me. Well, I can understand that's what I was that. terrified of. <laughs> but that's that was the fear that I would run into someone who is a hundred percent all in. And right. when I was fighting and when I lost my last kickboxing fight, I wasn't all in. And I knew I uh -huh, wasn't all uh -huh, in. Uh -huh. And I knew I knew I wasn't the same person I was when I was like eighteen, nineteen. I was a psychopath. I mean, I was one hundred percent committed to doing nothing but that. And then um, as I was examining my future prospects in my life and I started to become more aware of the problems of what I was doing, I became less and less. I, I had one fight that I had in California, in Anaheim, in the U.S. Nationals in 1980. It must have been my hmm, – it seems like it had to have been 86, 86 or 87, somewhere around there. 87 somewhere around 87 i i knocked this guy out with a, a head kick and i did in front of his parents and it was it was everybody was people were crying and he was unconscious for a long time 
he was unconscious for a solid half hour Ooh. and they dragged him they dragged him off of the uh the mat they put him in a stretcher they took him to the hospital i never saw him regain consciousness and uh i remember thinking that could have easily been me like i didn't have any illusions of me being some impervious in, invulnerable person and I was really thinking about how I, I, I hit him so hard. My heel was hurting the next day. I was walking with a limp from his head because I wheel kicked him in the head. It's a particularly brutal move where you spin and your, your, your whole leg comes around. And you're hitting someone in the head with your heel. And he felt like he had gotten shot, just fell face first, out cold, snoring. It wasn't the first time that I'd done that to someone, but it was – one of the most brutal because he kind of ran into it too. He was trying mm -hmm. to kick me as I was kicking him. So it was the force of his body coming towards me and me hitting him. And I was thinking that guy's probably never going to be the same again. Like he's never going to get over it psychologically, or if he does, it's going to be very hard for him, but he might, he might be damaged for the rest of his life. That's a real possibility. And then I started thinking, am I willing to have that happen to me at 19? I was 19 years old. I was like, is this, is this what you want to do? Do you want to get hit in the head like that and never be the same again at 19? Because it easily can happen, you know? Yeah, um, that's a, we were at a, 60 years to live like that. Yeah, we were at a – this was a national championship tournament. So he was a state championship, I think, from Illinois. And I was a state champion from Massachusetts. And, um, you know, it wasn't like he – was, he was a black belt. I mean, it wasn't like he was an unskilled guy. So the fact that I was able to do that to him and I was able to do that to a bunch of other guys, I knew that someone out there could do that to me. Right. I knew right. that I knew that I wasn't the best in the world. And I knew that even though I was uh, a top, I was, you know, I was a real national level competitor. I wasn't world class. I wasn't the best, especially at 19. Um, and so that doubt, that doubt stuck with me um, for the next couple of years. And it was, it was probably the first seed of uh, my new future was me hurting that guy and thinking about what that was going to be like if that happened to me. Yeah, well, that's a hell of a right turn you took there to go into comedy. So, okay, so how – now, you became successful as a comedian. So you started playing in little clubs like stand-up comedians did. And, like, yeah. how did you get your breaks? and How did your career develop? How well, it, um, it took a few years for me to get competent, you know, it took like two or three years for me to get competent. And then three years in, I got extremely fortunate again, where I met my manager, my manager, who's my manager to this day. He basically picked me up when I was an open mic comedian. I mean, I was, I was getting a few paid gigs here and there, but I was really an amateur. Um, and he found me. He was looking for new talent. He came up from New York. He is he was a like, you know, really well respected and well recognized manager, still is, of course. His name's Jeff Sussman. And we've been together for um uh, shit now. It must be twenty eight years. Yeah. We've been together since really since I was an amateur. And he well, that's, uh, a, that's a successful collaboration to to span that amount of time. Not many changes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been together forever. We've been together forever. We don't even have a contract anymore. Hmm. We haven't had a contract, I think, for like 10 years. So during all this time, this is just like a bit of a side, side question here, but you ever have any time at all to pursue relationships with women? No, oh, yeah. Well, you do comedy. You know, you're in clubs at night. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. have most of your day to do whatever you want. You know, to just, when I was just a stand-up comedian, I had a lot of free time. You know, I mean, you're writing jokes, but you can only do that a couple hours a day or you get bored and then it's not effective. And then you're just kind of living your life and hanging out. And sometimes the best way to develop your comedy is to have good social interactions. It's actually kind of important when you're uh, an aspiring comedian to be in a lot of social situations because you are around people, you hear people say things. And then you think what they say is silly or what they say is, you know, you disagree or you agree. You, you see perspectives and points of view and you kind of, you, you develop, you know, a, a, an understanding of how human beings behave. It's kind of very important. So, yeah, I, I, I was around a lot of different 
girls and a lot of guys and just being out and and you're always at comedy clubs and nightclubs but i didn't right. i didn't go out other than that you know I, if i wasn't at a comedy club at night i probably wasn't out you know mm. it was always the same thing with like my obsession with fighting and fighting came way easier for me than stand up did stand up was way harder for me it was way harder it was way what, harder what, to what achieve was harder, confidence what was harder about it well you said it took you two or three years to get competent so that was a lot of falling flat on your face i presume yeah and even then even like 3 years in i still could bomb at any moment <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean i could have a bad set i didn't know how to do it but also i was socially awkward i think it took me a while to uh to not be not be so socially awkward you know that was that was an issue and you know uh, it was a lot of it was from my upbringing but a lot of it was also i kind of cultivated that when i was fighting yeah i, I didn't want people to like me i didn't care hmm. like i didn't need them to like me all i needed them to do i mean i kind of wanted them to be scared of me you know i so when i was fighting i wasn't trying to make friends out there at all i was uh I was just trying to fuck people up. I mean, so so when, when you were fighting, when we were fighting, did you have any relationships with women? Or, was it, or were you pretty Not much good people? ones. Not no. good ones. No. I didn't, I wouldn't allow them to do, I, w I wouldn't allow them to have much of my time. You right. know, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I think to have a successful relationship, you have to spend a lot of time together. You have to communicate. You have to, you, they, the person has to almost be first place in your life. Yeah. And that was yeah, never, yeah. that was never happening. And so that was, that would come up very often. Like I was a girl that I was dating in high school. Uh, and you know, I, I used to teach at the school, so I had keys to the school. So, um, one time I took her up there cause, uh, I needed to get a workout in and she wanted to have sex at the gym. And I was like, there's no way I wouldn't do it. I was like, this place is sacred. Like there's no chance. Like she was trying to fool around, and I was, you know, I was adamant. I was like, "This is never happening. Like hmm. this might, this might as well Jesus. be a church to me." I was like, "It's not happening." And you know, I was so horny when I was 17 years old. <laughs> to yeah, yeah, me, that's... at 17 or 18, to say no to sex was crazy. Right, right. Like, that's a crazy not story. Happening. I think we're gonna we're gonna clip that and and put it in a little clip that says Joe Rogan tells a story that no sane man would believe. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was, that was the first refuge that I had from my life of despair. So for me, I wasn't going to screw that up. Right, 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 right. And I felt like disrespecting the, the, the academy like that. Yeah, well, they had been would, treating you like an adult. And that's something, yes. that's something when you're a teenager, you know, like to actually be treated that way. It's a good thing not to mess with if you're fortunate enough to have it. Well, I wouldn't even walk onto the training floor by myself with no one around without bowing uh-huh i mean there was no one there but i would never leave the the common area and step onto the training floor without bowing first right never never right. never okay so when you're in comedy now you said you, you said you were all in as a fighter and you, th you figure you went all in as a comedian too and did you do that right from the beginning yeah yeah pretty much yeah right away as soon as i realized that i could actually do this and as soon as I realized, I decided, I mean, my first set that I ever did, I had a bunch of my friends come down and watch me. And I wasn't good the first time I ever got on stage. But I got a couple of little chuckles and laughs. And then I realized this might be possible. I might be able to do this. And then I became obsessed with figuring out how to do it. Because it was, I, I saw it as a path. Like, okay, this is a thing. Like, this is a thing you could do that you actually love. Like, I was a huge fan of the art form. I loved watching it. Um, ever since my, my parents took me to the movies when I was like 14 or 15, we saw live on the sunset strip. It was a Richard Pryor movie, uh, in, in the theater where he did stand up, and I had never seen that before. And I remember thinking how crazy is it that this guy could just talk. And it's so funny. I was falling out of my chair laughing and I was looking around. I remember looking around while the movie was playing at all these people in their chairs, just rocking back yeah, and forth yeah, yeah. and laughing so hard. Yeah, it's really something it's amazing. To see. I saw it especially when you're a young teenager, like sixteen. I know you should oh, really? talk about Bill Cosby, but I saw him live, and like I saw him live too when I was a security guard. 
Oh yeah. I saw him live. Yeah, I was a security guard at at Great Woods. Uh, I saw Kennison there when I was a security guard. I saw Rodney Dangerfield there. Yeah, I saw quite a few people there. Yeah, well, it was something to see him sit on his stool with his cigar and get the whole audience like literally hysterical. I mean, the guy in front yeah. of me was rock, rock, rocking back and forth so hard he could hardly breathe. His wife kept elbowing him to get him to kind of, <laughs> you know, turn back into something vaguely resembling a human being. But it was it's really amazing to see someone with that much command of the audience and and so consistently, unbelievably funny. He's so. the most tragic story in all of show business. Man, if, if it's I a to, Next to Michael Jackson and O.J. Simpson. I mean, those are the, the three most tragic stories in show business, in, in my mind. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's a monster. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah I know. And a brilliant think, what, comedian is a What monster. the hell? You know, the thing that's so strange about Cosby, you'd think, well, like, was this really necessary? Like... Man, the guy was famous in 15 different directions and really well respected. You wouldn't have think he would have had to date rape his women, you know? It's just Well, yeah, I mean, he if he just he could have just had prostitutes. I mean, if he really just needed sex, I don't think that's what it was. No. I think there was a sick perversion and I think he liked to do that to people. He liked to trick them. I mean, I'm just guessing, right? Well, it has to be something but like that because it's something. so it's so counterproductive and so psychotic it's psychotic i mean i don't understand it you know no, i've tried no. to i've tried to sort of imagine what it must have been like to be around in the 50s and the 60s i think people did that to each other way more often than we'd like to admit and i think that it was more casual than we would think of today where people would slip someone a mickey or you know i mean he even had a bit that he did back in way back in the day about giving someone spanish fly that you'd give someone something that would make them horny. Right. I think he I think he was probably a guy that had an incredibly inflated opinion of himself, didn't want anybody to ever reject him, experienced that a few times. Again, this is pure speculation, and just decided that he was better than people, that he could just drug them. It's, it's so insane. strange though, because his comedy was basically so like it was generally family oriented. It was yes. you know, and he put himself forward as a role model and he was credible. Like he was credible as an actor, as a role model, and he seemed credible as a spokesperson. It's kinda kinda makes me think, you know, there's this idea that the psychoanalysts had. There's a guy named Eric Neumann, who was a student of Carl Jung's, and one of the things that Neumann said it wrote a book called Depth Psychology and the New Ethic right after World War II. And it's a, it's a great book, a little thin book, but it's a great book. And one of the things he says in that book is, don't be better than you are. And what he meant was, he didn't mean don't improve, like mm. that would be foolish. He meant beware of adopting a persona that makes you a far better person than you actually are because all of that part of you that you're not admitting to, that's going to go off and have its own life because mm. you're not integrating it. You know, you're suppressing it in some way and you're not. A, and, and so it's a living thing, you know, that, well, like the aggression you had when you were a fighter, that's a big, deep part of you. You know, you can't just push something like that aside and pretend that it's not there and think that it's not going to go off and have some fun when you're not paying attention. Yeah. So to me, like something like that must have got him, is that he was, he was split between this really mm. good guy that he was trying to be, which was like too good, and, and, and this, this like more monstrous side of his personality that he obviously never integrated or perhaps never even admitted to. It's really a hell mm. of a story, man. It's like, and it really is a catastrophe. I think it was an it's, absolute bloody catastrophe for his victims, it, obviously. And, but just as a general cultural phenomenon, it's so awful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it, you, you know, you, they say you should separate the man from the art. But in his case, it's almost impossible to do because his art was his perception of life. So like when you're watching him, it's not like a painter or even someone who makes a movie. It's like when you're watching him, you're watching him now and all you can think of as he's talking about these different things and about, I told my children, well, he's like, he's doing this lovable dad yeah. voice. And yeah. you know, so all you can think of is that guy rapes people, yeah. he drugs them and rapes them. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Yeah. I can't enjoy it anymore. Yeah. And he's unquestionably, as, as far as like his skill, he was one of the greatest of all time. Yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah. you got you got a manager, and you got a good one. And what happened? Yeah. Uh, I moved to New York, and then uh, once I moved to New York, I started doing a ton of stand-up comedy. Uh, I was traveling all over the place, and I got better and better, and I kept working on it, working on it, and just doing a lot of gigs and just going all over the place. And and then um, a so few years were, later, how old were you? Were about how old were you by the time you were like paying your bills? Because that was your first marker for success. Probably like twenty six. 25, 26 was when it all started coming together. Oh, yeah, so that's um, not too bad. That's not too yeah, bad. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't not old making a lot of money. I was making enough money to eat and pay my rent. Um, and then um, somewhere around then, I did a thing called the MTV Half Hour Comedy Hour. That was a, uh, a, it was a television show they had on MTV. And each comedian, I mean, I don't know how much time I did on the show. I think you do like seven to ten minutes or something like that. Wasn't a lot of time. And I had a set, and I did it on television. It went really well. And then uh, next thing you know, I got all these offers to do television shows. I got development deal offers. And then before you know it, I'm living in California. It was like that. I mean, within a year, I was living in California, and I was on a sitcom. And, uh, and then that sitcom got canceled and, uh, I thought I was going to move back to New York. It was called uh, hardball. It was hardball. A, a, a baseball show on Fox. It was a sitcom about a baseball team. Um, that show got canceled. And then, uh, I got a development deal with NBC. I was going to move back to New York, but I had signed a lease, uh, for my apartment. I, I hated LA. I hated actors. I didn't like it. I did. Hmm. It was so. It was so disingenuous. The worlds that I had come from were the worlds of stand-up comedy, which is about as real as you can get. Either you're funny or you're not. And then the world of fighting, which was even more real than that. Um, so, and then all of a sudden, I was around all these people that were just full of shit and weird. And it was the, they were put on these personas, and they wanted the casting agents to like them and the producers to like them, and everything was fake. And everybody knew it was fake, but they all accepted it, and they talked fake, and they and it was it was very very strange, very hard for me to deal with. I really didn't like actors. I didn't like being, and the only place well, that I sought refuge. It's a funny thing that there'd be an automatic assumption that because you were a good stand-up comedian, that somehow you'd be an actor. Like, yeah, they seem to be the same thing. No, they're not. But the thing is that a lot of comedians had gone on to be super successful in the world of sitcoms, like right. Roseanne Barr, Jerry Seinfeld, Tim Allen, those type of people. They had, had these huge careers, Brett Butler. So because of that, all that was happening at the same time. This was like in 94 ish when I got on TV for the first time. Um, and they that was what they were pushing. And then agents and managers would push that too, because obviously you can make a tremendous amount of money. So uh, that show got canceled, but I had a lease for this apartment. So I was kind of stuck in LA. So I was like, all right, let me just stay out here and uh, see what happens for a year. That was my thought. And then um, I got a development deal with NBC. They wanted to do a sitcom with me. And then I wound up auditioning for a show that they had already had called News Radio. And that was with Dave Foley and Phil Hartman and Maura Tierney and Candy Alexander and Stephen Root and Andy Dick and uh, Vicki Lewis. And we did that show for five years. And then, um, you know, by that time, uh, I had done a lot of stand up at the comedy store. When that show was canceled, Fear Factor came along and I was touring as a comedian. And now that's a whole still switch there. OK, so now yeah. you go from sitcoms to Fear Factor. So how the hell did yeah. that happen? And why did well, you? Well, it happened. NBC came up to me with the idea because I was on NBC previously and they, they liked me. And then part of the thing was that I didn't want to work with actors anymore. I was, uh, was happy that Fear Factor was no actors. And I was like, oh, good. This is easier to do. Um, it's just me talking to people. And since I had a background in coaching, because I had coached a lot of people at tournaments, uh, in competition. And I taught a lot at Boston University. I taught at my own school. Um, I, you know, with Taekwondo, I was used to teaching people and I was used to encouraging people. 
and, and getting people motivated. And I knew how to, I knew how to get fired up for competition. I understood. So you were actually, and, you were actually one of the rare people in the world who was actually trained to be the right host for fear factor. Yeah. In a lot of ways, <laughs> luckily, fortuitously, because I, I like, I would, when someone was nervous and they're about to do something, I, I could grab them and go, look at me, you could do this. This is going to define you. If you back off right now and you get scared and you give in to your fears and your anxieties, this is going to define you. Or if you just press forward and realize you can do this and succeed, it will define you in a positive way and you'll build momentum in that direction. You can do this. And I, would, I was really good at giving people pep talks. I was really good at firing people up. And it was part of the gig that it was, like, it was uh, completely unexpected. Because I thought the gig was just going to be these people do these crazy things and, you know, I make fun of it, which is part of my job. And I, you know, we all cheer and, and it would all play itself out because it was a reality show. And it was sort of a game show slash reality show. It was like a hybrid. But somewhere along the line, especially when they became really nervous, uh, it, 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 it was very intense. Hmm. And there was moments where I really... I wanted these people to win. You know, I wanted these people to do their best. I wanted these people to succeed. You know, and to be yeah, able well, to encourage someone. Treating, man, and you know, from yeah. that's the basis of psychotherapy. So, you know, it's really something to get people to face their fears. I mean, you were doing it in a very idiosyncratic way, very a very uh, what unique way. But yeah, imagine it was, that it was psychologically strange. compelling very often. Got any particular got any particular stories from that time? You got a good story from Fear Factor? Well, there was one time where there was this couple, uh, not couple, a family. It was a father and a son competing against a mother and the daughter. And the father and the son were kind of jerks, which was part of the competition. There was a lot of trash talking, but they were really cocky. And they thought that they were going to win, you know, and it was, you know, they had this the parent and child teams had gotten down to two and it was the man and his son versus the woman and her daughter. And everybody thought these jerks were going to win and we were kind of bummed out about it. But the, the women, the woman and her child you know, they just rose to the occasion. And I mean, I remember talking to them and firing them up, but I still, I didn't know if they could do it. What, what, was, what was the challenge? It was some crazy thing that they had to climb and do this thing. And the, the, I, I don't really remember all of it. Like they had to gather flags. It was all for time. But the son, the kind of jerky son, the jerky dad, they kept screwing up and they, they, they fucked up because, you know, they, they'd kind of taken it for granted that they were going to win. Uh -huh. And when the pressure hit them and they knew it was all on the line, a lot of times jerks are just insecure. And when they're under pressure, when they're really faced with real pressure, like this is the real moment. Who are you really? Fuck all that talk. Who are mm -hmm. you really? They fall apart. And the mother and the daughter won. And you're talking about a hardened crew of people that had watched people eat animal dicks and jump out of helicopters for season after season, episode after episode. You know, we did a hundred and something shows, a hundred and I don't even remember how many shows, like probably 140 episodes of that show. Everybody cried. Hmm. The camera people, like I'll cry now if I'm thinking about it. Hmm. Hmm. When so the mother and the daughter won. It's so affecting. I mean, there's a justice so component to it, right? There's a comeuppance. It was a, it was a comeuppance. It was an underdog. It was just seeing their spirit, you know, when, when they were figuring out a way to win, watching them win or to this day. I'll tell day. you, one of the things that makes me really happy about this interview <laughs> so far is that like I have a tendency to tear up in interviews, um, as you may have noticed, but this time it was you, so I'm I'm quite pleased about that. It's yeah, a very I touching story, though, man. <laughs> you do, eh? 
Yeah, yeah, but particularly like that. I don't yeah. tear up for sad things. I tear up for happy things. You know, yeah, that yeah, was a, yeah. That was well, a that's, that's an interesting thing to, to to think about too, because it's not exactly happy, right? It's because you know when these people come up to me and they tell me their stories, that often makes me tear up because it's like it's like this blast of dead bloody seriousness with a happy ending, you know. So it's, yeah. it's a comedy because it's a happy ending, but it's yeah. rough and affecting, and it. It, 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 that makes me tear up. And I, th I think my proclivity, I've always kind of had that ever since I was a kid, but it seems to have come back. Me too. With the, well, you too, eh? Huh. Yeah, yeah, always, always. But it's always been happy things. It's never been sad things. It's very hard to get me to cry with sad things. Sad triumph. things, I sort of just, yeah, triumph, success. Yeah. Um, people pulling through, like uh, post-fight interviews when, I'm, when I work for the UFC. When someone has like a particularly incredible performance, I, I have the fight off tearing up. I feel so happy for them. It's, it's, you know? isn't, it, isn't it strange that it's that same response to sorrow? That's the same response to sorrow and triumph. That yeah, that, that tearing it is. Up, you know, like what the hell's up with that? I don't, I don't understand yeah. that at all. I mean, I well, guess it's, it's also kind of a sign of empathy. <laughs> Yes, it is definitely a sign of empathy. But it's what's also odd is that with sad things, I can I can I can objectively analyze them, and uh, I I cannot get sad. I can understand that this is just life, and it is what it is. And hmm. I mean, I won't feel good, but I won't start weeping. I don't weep for like sad things the way I weep for happy things. So you, that's interesting. So, so in some sense, you've you've trained yourself to detach yourself from that kind of sorrow, but not to detach yourself from triumph. I can rationalize and understand sorrow. I can internalize it. I get it. I know, I know what it is. And, uh, you know, I just get so happy for people sometimes mm -hmm. when things go well. Yeah. One of my guilty pleasures is I, I really like uh, America's Got Talent and the BBC <laughs> equivalent. What the hell's the BBC equivalent? Is it the X Factor? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And it does the same thing to me. I'd see somebody schlub, out there, schlub themselves out there on the stage looking pretty, pretty damn dreadful in about four different dimensions and then, like, knock it out of the park. It really... Yeah. It's, it's really something to... It's yeah, really it's something to see. amazing. Well, because yeah. I think we, per, as a human being, you realize how hard it is to overcome competition or these difficult moments or these these moments when you're tested and you know there's fears and insecurities that these people have to battle as well as the actual physical task in front of them there's so much going on and it, yeah. there's so much anticipation and nerves and anxiety involved in that that to see someone triumph i mean it's i am a, a student of human will i i love stories of discipline and success i don't yeah. like bad stories. i don't even like going to movies where they're sad when people tell me about sad movies, I'm like, stop. I'm not going to that movie. I don't uh -huh. like it. I don't want to uh -huh. see it. I'm not interested. I know what sadness is. I've been sad. I get it. I'm not interested in getting that in a form of entertainment. I like success. I like, I like seeing people triumph. I like, I like that's, seeing the human spirit manifest itself in spectacular ways. Yeah, that's why I like my lectures. That's why it's so fun to do them, you know, because I'm out there trying to tell people that they have the opportunity to do that. And to point out to them too that if they watch themselves, they notice they love that. Because you know, that's yeah. one of the things, you go to a basketball game or a hockey game or something like that, and somebody makes a spectacular play and it's a little celebration of the human spirit, yeah. ability yeah. to do something impossible in the moment and everybody's up on their feet, like in one yeah. second, go man, go. Yeah, and that's, yeah. Like, that's, that's uh, the more of that, the better as far as I'm concerned. There's so much. Yep concentration on our on our you know the destruction we wreak on the planet and our original sin and our weakness and that you know the terrible things we do to each other it's really nice to see those situations where people are celebrating the triumph of an individual in a group like that and it really says something wonderful about human beings deep in their core for all of our problems it's really something to be part of that yeah, I couldn't agree more, and I think we concentrate way too often and way too much on the negative aspects of people. 
You know, I mean, you know, it's almost like things- sports is about the only place that doesn't happen. You know, it's kind of strange because you do concentrate on the positive in sports. You celebrate the winners. You know, the cameramen don't go over and interview the losers. You know, I mean, they'll yeah. talk about all that, but and it, it's it, I don't know why it is that in sports it's okay to 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 celebrate the triumphant and the victorious, but it is okay, mm. and, and no one questions it. It's it's. Or well, that's not true because now they have like non-competitive games for kids, and you know that's part of yeah. the politically correct curriculum. But most of the Nonsense. time, most sane people will celebrate along with a victorious athlete, and that's really something. All right, so fear factor. How many years did that last? Six years. Were they good years? It was good financially. <laughs> yeah, well, that's something. I made I made a ton of money, and it uh, alleviated financial pressure. But I enjoyed doing it some somewhat. But it was not like the way I enjoy the other things that I do. It's not like I enjoy stand up comedy. It's not like I enjoy working for the UFC. It's not like I enjoy doing podcasts. All those things that I just talked about, those three things, those things are labors of love. I they're passions. They're things that I'm really genuinely fascinated by and interested in like this conversation. I would have this conversation with you if it was just you and me and there was no cameras. I would love to have this conversation. I love having conversations with interesting people. Um, I love stand up comedy. I love all those things. I didn't love being there for fear factor, but it was a great job and I knew it was a great job and I knew I was really lucky to have it. So it was great in that respect. But when it was over, I kind of decided I was done with television when it was over. I was like, okay, I think I'm done with this. No more of this. From like from here on out, I'm just going to concentrate on my own stuff. And so uh, from then on out, I just really focused on stand-up comedy. And that's when my comedy career really took off, was post-Fear Factor. I mean, I had a comedy career during Fear Factor, but it really took off post-Fear Factor because I really gave it all of my attention. And so what, was, what, what happened after Fear Factor that boosted you on the comedy, on the comedy circuit? Um, well, I did, uh, a special for Comedy Central and Spike TV called Talking Monkeys in Space in 2009. That was like probably my best work up until then. And then, um, you know, from then I've been on a pretty steady pace of doing specials every two years or so ever since then. Right, right, right. And that's been successful nonstop. Are you getting better? Yeah. And it's, yeah, I think I am. I think I'm getting better. I think it's one of those things that as long as you keep concentrating on it and as long as you keep focusing on it, you're getting better. I think my hour that I'm doing now is as good as anything I've ever done. And it's not even done yet. It's only, you know, six months into this hour, but uh, I think it's some of my best work ever. And I'm really excited to see where it comes. Well, I mean, there's no rush because it's only six months since my last one. I probably will work on this for another year before I even think about recording it. Oh yeah, so if it's good now, it should be really good by then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's like a samurai sword. You're you're folding the metal and hammering the blade, yeah. and folding the metal and hammering the blade, and you got to know when it's ready. And I'll start to get a sense of where it's ready in about a year. In about one year, then I'll start going. All right, this seems pretty solid. Maybe it's time to rock and roll. And then uh, I'll contact Netflix, and I'll say, uh, Hey, let's do it. You know, let's so. Uh, let's, set it up in whatever just whatever city i decide and i'll just i'll pick a city i'll pick it i'll just run it over in my head i'll pick a name for it you know well maybe i'll try to stay posted on what you're doing and come down and see it that'd be fun yeah i missed it last time you were here in toronto but i'd like to come and see one of your shows live i think that'd be a blast so yeah okay so so the next was the ufc eh yeah that was tv too kind of UFC happened while I was on news radio, actually. While I was on news radio, I started working for the UFC way back in 1997. Uh, but it was the UFC was more of a sideshow back then. It was uh, banned from cable. You could only get it on satellite TV. Right, and right. It was, it was a freak show. People didn't know about it. I mean, I loved it because as a lifelong martial artist, to me, it was fascinating to watch all these different styles compete against each other. But um, it didn't pay much money. And even though it was enjoyable for me, it got in the way of other aspects of my life. And so I quit around 1998. And then um, somewhere along the line in around 2001, the UFC was purchased by this new company. 
And when they purchase this, my earphones are dying. I'm going to have to take these off and unplug this here. Can you hear me still? Is that good? Yeah. It's good? Okay. Um, once it started, uh, once uh, the new company took over, they were trying to get people to, uh, to go to their events. And uh, they asked me to go to the event. You know, it's when I was doing Fear Factor. And so I went and watched it live. And uh, when I was watching it live, um, I was talking to Dana White, who is the president of the UFC, and just talking to him about the sport and all these different things I think about. And are you interested in this guy? I was asking about various obscure fighters who were competing in Japan. Maybe he didn't know about you should try to get these guys. And then somewhere along the line, he said, hey, you want to do commentary? And I I kind of, I was like, I don't want to work, man. I'm just here. I just want to enjoy this. Mm -hmm. So he and I became friends and he talked me into doing it. And, uh, I, I first did it for free. I did like 12 events or so for free, just for fun. I, so I was like, just get tickets for my friends and I'll go and I'll do commentary for you. But I, I didn't take it that seriously. I just, I didn't ever think it was going to be, you know, a career. Right. And I right. would be this, um, you know, well-known commentator in mixed martial arts i just thought i was doing it as a favor for them and for fun for me and uh you know lo and behold here we are 18 years later i'm still doing it <laughs> i presume yeah, they're paying you out. now what's up i presume they're paying you now oh yeah they pay me a lot oh, that's yeah. good that's good that that's better bargaining position i would say yeah yeah it's they're very generous okay so so that that's kind of an understandable transition in some sense because you know you got you you got your social skills highly developed and you got your ability to be witty on demand highly developed and to pay attention to an audience and you had the martial arts background and so UFC commentator that that makes sense it's that all right so now where does the podcast come in how the hell well, does that happen next yeah, I guess podcast. it's next isn't it yeah, the podcast was 2009, I guess, when I first started. And the podcast was basically, um, it was just for fun. It was like something to do with my friends. Me and my friend Brian, we just decided to set up a laptop and uh, people would ask questions and we would just start just talking about things. And then it became a weekly thing. And then we started uploading it to iTunes. And then, um, you know, I started getting guests. And then, uh, as the, the, I mean, it took years before it was profitable. I mean, I, I just, it was just for fun forever. Like a lot of things that I've done, it was originally just for fun. Well, that's you know? pretty early podcast too, though, eh? 2009. So very early. Yeah. I mean, podcasts were, I mean, for lots of people, they're still not a thing, although that's really changed in the last three or four years. I mean, you yeah, know, they're, they're definitely a mainstream uh, media phenomenon now, but 2009, I mean, that was, that was fringe stuff fundamentally. Yes. Yeah. It was very fringe. There was so there uh, be, just a few an advertising ones. market at that point. I wouldn't have thought not much of one. No, anyways. no, there was no ads. We didn't have ads for years. Um, and then, um, slowly ads started trickling in. The first ad was the fleshlight, which is a oh, yeah. masturbation <laughs> device. It was so, it was a funny story about Sam Harris. Sam Harris, uh, who was a guest really early on when the Fleshlight was the only sponsor, requested that we not have the Fleshlight as a sponsor on the episode that he was on. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. So I, I took the, uh, that week off. I just decided no, uh, no sponsor that week. And, that, that, uh, that is that, that's funny for, for very many reasons. It's funny that yeah. that was your first. Well, you know, pornography leads the way, right? Yeah, get it, well, get on the internet. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. And you know, what's even also funnier is that the guy who was, um, I guess he was the CEO of the Fleshlight or marketing something or another. The Fleshlight, he went on to form On It with me. So On It, which is my fitness and supplement company, he and I are partners in this, and it came out of our. Uh, the thing with the flashlight, our business agreement, because it was really profitable for the flashlight. And he realized early on, like, wow, like having 
a podcast sponsor something can be incredibly lucrative hmm. if the podcast is well respected and well received. Like this is sort of an untapped advertising market. Hey, let's start a business and just use the podcast as uh, a method of launching this business and let's see how it goes. Right. So the right, podcast right. that's and that became very successful too. But the podcast sort of um, took on a life of its own. It went from being just me hanging out with comedians, talking to me, interviewing people like you, or having conversations, I should say, more than interviewing people like you and, you know, scientists and archaeologists and doctors and, I mean, everyone. World yeah, well, right. You started, talking, oh, you started talking to everyone. Yeah, everyone. Really and everyone. It, and it was mostly, mostly comedians to begin with? Yes. It was almost all comedians in the beginning. And the, the everyone part is interesting because that's something that people resist or resent more than anything now. Like uh, the thing about this that you see now, you see this, this, this expression, giving someone a platform. Yeah. Why would you give some, a, someone a platform with those ideas? It's like, it, and it really comes down to this concept of silencing opinions that you don't agree with. And my thought on it was, has always been, I want to talk to all kinds of different people. And even if I don't agree with them, I want to find out why they think the way they do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's also an element of useful disagreeableness there. It's like, I'm going to talk to whoever the hell I want to. Yeah. Like, I don't care what you think about it. I interviewed Milo, speaking of people that you're not supposed to be talking to. Recently? Yeah, like a week ago. Yeah. So Did you take I, a lot of heat from that? I, it hasn't been broadcast yet. I don't uh -huh. think I'm going to. I don't think I'm going to take a lot of heat for it, you know, because... It was, we didn't have a political discussion. What we did had I talk about? We a psychological about? discussion. Well, oh, that's I, interesting. Was, I was really curious about how he got taken down, you know, when he, mm -hmm. when he was talking about his, his, his sexual abuse when he was a kid and defending yeah. it in some sense. Like, I yeah. watched that, that interview, and I knew he was in trouble as soon as he completed it. I figured, no, mm. you're, you said things that you're not allowed to say. And right. I think the part of it was that, see, I was split in two parts watching it, partly because I was also watching it as a clinician. I thought that it was admirable of Milo to refuse to take the victim stance because he had been such an anti-victim, uh, what would you call it, agitator or advocate, mm -hmm. right? And so he said, well, I was a full participant in this. But then the right. clinical side of me thought, no man, you haven't updated your memory since you were 14. Like, you're still thinking of adult Milo as 14-year-old Milo, and you're not thinking about 14-year-old Milo as a kid. And so mm -hmm. that was sad for me to see that, because often when people are traumatized, in some sense, around the area of trauma, they don't mature. Like, it's like they get stuck. Well, look, yeah. imagine that you're on a path and you, you, you come towards an obstacle that's impenetrable, but you really need to get through it to, to fully develop. Like, it's part of what you need to grow up, but you can't. So you walk around it, you know, but you leave the part of yourself that could have matured behind there. And because it didn't deal with the challenge, like this is sort of what you were experiencing maybe on Fear Factor, maybe why you're such a what you're so emotionally affected by triumph. It's like you get defeated by something like that. You can't overcome it. There's part of you that gets stuck there in a sense. And it's something Freud observed like a hundred and, uh, my damn near must be 120 years ago that people would fixate at a certain age because something had happened to them or at least part of their personality would. And I could see that happening with Milo. And I thought that he was in a really tough spot because he'd been molested. He didn't want to play the victim. He Yet he actually was a victim, which was the perverse yeah. goddamn thing. And that, you know, the way he spoke about it could easily have been twisted, misinterpreted, partly because of his own doing, into a quasi-justification for pedophilia. And then he also said, well, you know, that this was relatively common practice in the gay community. And I figured he'd be cut to ribbons for, for, for bringing that up. But mm. he said in, in the interview, it was really weird, you know. He said that uh, it wasn't the left-wingers that took him out. It was the conservatives. Really? And they were mad because he, he was slated to talk, speak at CPAC. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the straight Republican types, not the Trump types, you know, but the, but the more classically conservative Republicans, 
didn't think that Milo Yiannopoulos was the right kind of guy to have speaking at CPAC. And so his sense is that it was actually the, the moderate right that wiped him out. And so that was, wow. that was interesting, and I didn't expect that. And he, I, we also talked a fair bit about, um, I can't tell you all of it because then nobody has to watch the damn podcast but, um, <laughs> or listen to it, but, you know, he's, he's also shifted his viewpoint quite substantially on what happened to him when he was 14, and he, he describes the process he went through to kind of rethink that, not least mm. because of all the controversy it caused. So, you know, I think, well, that was our conversation. It lasted a couple hours. It was... You know, I asked him how he was doing and what he was planning on doing and, and, and that. And so that was kind of interesting to find out too. But um, we never got into anything that was remotely political. And so I was happy to have had the conversation. You know, the thing about people like Milo is I don't give a damn what you say about them. Alex Jones is the same sort of person. I think the same thing about Tommy Robinson, for that matter. It's like these people are interesting. Like they're strange yeah. people and they have, they have an effect on the world. And like, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to, what are you not supposed to be curious about that? It's like, yeah, this is, you it's not it's be curious about Milo? Thing. Yeah. It's the deplatforming thing. Like they, they, they have this idea that you should not have a differing opinion. If you have a differing opinion, it should never get a platform. And yeah, well, it's I also think, more perverse than that even. It's the idea that if you give someone like that, quote, a platform, so now you're willing to talk to them, that you must agree with them merely yes. because you're conversing with them. And it's like, yes. that, and that's a, that's, a, that's a, well, that guilt by association assumption is, it's a terrible Nonsense. assumption. What does it mean? It, you're only going to talk to people who hold exactly the same ethical views that you hold on anything. On everything. Yeah, it's, it's nonsense. It's like that data in society thing that came out connecting everybody as alt-right gateways because they've talked to people that are on the right. You know, I, I, I tweeted that lady when she wrote that. I said that Barbara Walters interviewed Castro. Does that make her a communist? And it's, it's basically how I, my take on all this stuff is. There's nothing wrong with talking to people. And I feel like Milo... In a, well, Milo, you know, almost has been his own worst enemy because he's such a provocateur. And yeah. now they've turned a lot of that stuff that he was saying as a provocateur and they've turned it against him. Um, but I think that you and him have this one thing in common in that you get categorized by lazy people who are, are not good at nuance. And they put you in this box that other people have created. And this box is oh, this is an alt-right this. This is a conservative that. This guy's a Nazi. This guy's a white supremacist. This guy's a that. Whatever it is, they put you in that box. And then socially, you have to, in order to fit into the ideology, in order to fit into this group think, you have to sort of accept these definitions, that this person's bad, you know, that that person, Gavin McGinnis is a Nazi, Milo Yiannopoulos is a Nazi, that these people are this, these are the problem, without any real understanding of who those people really are, without any real grasp. Yeah, well, that of, happened to Sargon of the Cad, right? Happened yeah. To Carl Benjamin. Hey, yeah. by the way, we're launching our alternative social media platform soon. Excellent. What it going, yeah, it's going to be, well, we, we tried out the first of the technology I just deb debated Slavoj Žižek on Friday and last Friday, and he was hypothetically the world's foremost Marxist philosopher. Although it turned out that he wasn't really a Marxist at all, he called himself a Hegelian, which is actually way different than being a Marxist. And so it wasn't really much of a debate. It was more me attacking the Communist Manifesto for half an hour, which <laughs> I found rather, rather straightforward thing to do, and then us having a rather peculiar and productive discussion for about an hour and a half. But anyways, mm. ThinkSpot tested their technology, so the live stream technology, and we've got some cool features that no other platform has. So it'll be a subscription service, and so that's partly what makes it a replacement for Patreon to some degree, you know, because we want to be mm -hmm. able to monetize creators. But we've got new different terms of service, and so the essential issue with the terms of service will be that once you're on our platform. We won't take you down. 
unless we're ordered to by a U.S. court of law. That's mm. basically the idea. So we're trying to make an anti-censorship platform. And then we've got, there's other features too that are quite cool and unique. So for example, it's, you might be interested in this with regards to your podcast. So if you listen to your podcast on our platform, people will be able to like pick a time in the podcast, uh, like maybe a 30 second clip and just mark it out. And then they'll be able to either make a written comment about it or an auditory comment and then send that to a friend or post it so that there mm. can be running, continual running conversations in audio and written form on podcast content constantly. Mm. We want to do the same thing for YouTube videos so that people can append their own video to any part of a video and then distribute that to their network or also post it so that people can watch, you know, so that we're hoping we can get a real dialogue. We can really add dialogue to the, to the podcast and, and YouTube world. We're also going to do the same thing with books. So if you buy an ebook on the platform, you'll be able to annotate publicly. And so what that should mean is that every book that's sold on our platform that many people purchase will become the center of multiple conversations. And we can do that with books that are uh, in the public domain. So, for mm. example, one of the books we're going to post right away is Beyond Good and Evil by Nietzsche. And I'm going to start annotating it. You know, and so what, what that should mean, you know, if you look at the Bible, it's a good example. People have been annotating it for like 5,000 years, right? Every verse has God books written on it. So it's just this incredibly expanded document that's pulled in thousands and thousands of people to this collective conversation. And this platform should be able to uh, allow people to do that with, with great works of art and well, and then with also with current, current affairs and events and such as, well, YouTube videos and podcasts. And so it's nice looking too. It, 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 it's got a fairly professional feel. We're hoping that we'll be able to pull people who are interested in intelligent conversation specifically into this platform, you know, and maybe start to pull them away from YouTube and some of the less specialized channels. I'm hoping it's a that, that plus, you know, our anti-censorship stance. And it'll be invitation only to begin with so that we can, well, so that we can beta test it, make sure the damn thing works and that we're not mm -hmm. fooling ourselves about its appeal. So that's come a long ways. And hopefully, I think we've got four, five, six people who are interested, who are lined up. Ruben is going to use it. I'm going to use it. James Altucher, uh, Jocko Willink, Michael Shermer. I think those are, oh, and, and uh, Carl, Carl Benjamin, Sargon of the CAD. They'll be our first beta testers, fundamentally. We've that sounds out. awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. If, if the bloody thing works, I'd like to have a conversation with you about it at some point. Because oh, for sure. I'd love to try it. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I'll let, I'll let the developer know. And, um, but I think, the, I think the annotation feature could be really cool. And we're also setting it up so that if you do comment, your, all the comments will be up and down voted. And if your ratio of down votes to up votes falls below 50-50, then your comments will be hidden. People will still be able to see them if they click, but you'll disappear, you know, mm. from, from the mainstream. And we don't know if 50-50 is right. We're going to have to play with that because we're also trying to control stupid trolling. And I think we're going to put a minimum length requirement on for written comments. So that you can't just say four words, like this guy's a fucking right. idiot, you know, like, no, right. we don't need that. So that, you know, right. if the minimum comment length is 50 words, you're going to have to put a little thought into it. Even if you're being a troll, hopefully you'll right. be a quasi witty troll. So <laughs> anyways. Yeah, that's the ultimate battle, right? Is trying to combat the trolls in some sort of a way or mitigate their, their impact. Yeah, well, it's, it's the ultimate battle is to do that without being censorious, right? Because yeah, you want people yeah. to be able to express their opinion, but there's a difference between, it's a subtle, but there's a difference between productive dialogue and, and provocation without wit for the purpose yeah, I, of causing trouble. 
there's so many people out there that are just bored and that's what they use the internet for. They're at work, they're in a cubicle all day and they get their jollies out of just fucking with people online. Um, and my producer, Jamie, he has a friend who does that. I mean, this is what this friend does. He has a bunch of accounts and he just trolls people. He tries to troll celebrities and he tries to get them to respond to him. And he says mean things to them. And you know, that's how he, uh, that's how he entertains himself. See, while that's he's at that work. same dark side that, that was manifesting up to a much greater degree in Bill Cosby, yeah. you know? It's yeah, like, right. Guy, well, the guy, guy is also depressed. He's also a depressed guy. He's a, yeah. a failure in life. And, you know, he's everything you would expect. Yeah. Someone well, who uses that kind of time for recreation. Right. So, you know, the issue with him is like he should take some of that. So if he would admit to himself his aggression, if he'd come to terms with it, he could take that damn aggression and he could in integrate it into his personality. And that yeah. would make him able to focus on his life. You know, like you said, when you, you, know, you started your, your martial arts fighting, that you were obsessed, eh? And you were also sick of being pushed around and all of that. And you were, like, willing to do something about it. But obviously, and it's obvious just talking to you, that the aggressive part of your character is, like, deeply integrated inside of you. It's not hiding out in some corner doing stupid things that, you know, you're not paying attention to. It's right there at hand. And you get a guy like the one you're talking about, he's split into meek and depressed and ineffectual on the one hand and cruel and resentful and bitter on the other. Mm. And if those two things would marry, you know, he'd get half his personality back and, and maybe some of his dynamism. And so it's yeah. a real waste of time. Well, I think a lot of people just feel just totally powerless. And they feel like this is the only way they can affect others is by reaching out and trolling or saying mean things. And I think that many people take these terrible paths in lives in their lives, which are not productive and they don't, they don't feel good about it. They don't, they don't respond well to whatever they're doing with their life. And they have this constant state of anxiety. It's like Thoreau's quote, most men live lives of quiet desperation. So yes, one of my except the trolls quotes. live lives of noisy desperation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very. That's similar. what the internet. That's what the internet has allowed. <laughs> yes, Jordan. I got to wrap this up. I got to get out of here. Unfortunately, this is a, a long and wonderful conversation, though. Like we always have. Hey, well, we, we really damn near got you. caught up. Do you got thirty seconds? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sure. Well, let let's end it off. I want to know what. Okay. What. What are you up to next, man? Like, what do you want to have happen? You've got this crazy reach. You've got this crazy platform. What's, what, what's, what's on your horizon? Anything I just, other than what you're doing? No. No, I just enjoy what I'm doing. I like to continue doing what I'm doing. I'm very happy that people enjoy the show. I'm very, very happy that it's affecting people in a positive way, that they're getting inspiration out of it, and they're getting information and entertainment and education. And uh, it means the world to me. I love it. I love doing the podcast. I love doing stand up. I love everything that I'm doing. I mean, I'm very, very happy with my my career and family life. I couldn't be happier. So I just like to keep doing what I'm doing. I don't have any crazy aspirations other than continuing to get better at everything that I try to work at. Yeah, well, that's that's a crazy aspiration, man. Because you, you <laughs> go, well, you got a lot of things going for you, you know, that are very, very unlikely, you know, and to and to hope, I don't mean to hope that they'll get better, but to continue to work to get those better, that seems like sufficient aspiration from my perspective. So look, I I'd think like if to... you work at anything, if you work at anything, you're trying to improve. And if you, there's, there's, you know, there's always room. There's always room for improvement in everything, yep. in, every, yep, in your personality, in your work, in everything. And that, yep. that's what I strive for. I strive for improvement. Yeah, well, that edge of improvement's a good place to be. Look, yeah. I wanted also to thank you, just, just so you know it. You know, you're, especially that first interview you did with me, that was really helpful to me. And, I mean, I've enjoyed all the talks that we've had, and, and they've been really productive, and they've, they've had a, well, a very big impact on my life, but lots of people have watched them. And so they seem to be, it seems to me that we've had a pretty productive series of interactions, but uh, I do, you owe, do owe you some some thanks and also thanks for coming on this podcast man it was really good my pleasure my and pleasure I will, and i will definitely talk to you about think spot if once we get it going and see that it works because it's look i didn't have any hope for its success when it first 
I know it was a little ugly baby thing because, you know, it's too impossible, but it's looking pretty damn good and it's got some cool features. So it'd be nice to have a censorship free platform if we could figure out how to do that. That sounds very exciting. I'm, I'm very interested. I can't wait to try it. All right, man. Thank you, Jordan. Hey, thanks a lot. My pleasure. Good luck. Hey, good luck with your improvement. And I'm looking forward Thank you. to the comedy special. Thank you, my brother. Take care. Ciao, Joe.